Welcome to the lock in, everybody. It's Friday. I'm Barry Chandler, and I'm here to drink whiskey, listen to music, chat with great guests, and hang out with you all. Have a bit of crack at the end of the week. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're healthy. I hope you're safe. I hope things are looking up for you wherever you are. We are going to uh, get together tonight, as we always do, and raise a glass to each other, to our health, hopefully, and to uh, hope that the world is changing for the better for all of us. And I'm delighted to join you every week and raise a glass to that. We've been doing it now for more than a year. We never thought we would, but for as long as we have to, we'll keep raising glasses together until we can do it in person. And it's great to see that some people in the world tonight can do so in person and hoping that more of us can do that soon as well. So welcome to the lock-in, three great whiskeys, two great guests. Let's get kicked off. Yes, in this house we drink Irish whiskey. There's no time to drink anything else, only Irish whiskey. So we've got three great whiskeys that we're going to sip on tonight. We've got a, a wonderful 10-year-old Bushmills single malt, which we will be kicking off with in just a minute. I will then move on to the Redbreast 12-year-old, and we will end the evening with Tullamore Dew 15-year-old. Um, three very familiar names, I think, to all of you. When I was growing up in Ireland, there were staples in households you maybe had a bottle of Powers or a bottle of Paddy or a bottle of Jameson, perhaps. And then if you went to the bar, you might see they had fancier whiskies behind the bar. And there was this old plinth, a wooden plinth that had a number of whiskies on it that were a little bit better than maybe the pouring brands. And on that plinth, you would have had Redbreast 12-year-old. You would have had Bushmills 10-year-old. There was no Tullamore Dew representation, strangely enough. I think Tullamore was always focused on the overseas markets, not the Irish market. But Redbreast 12 and, and Bushmills 10, I think you'll agree, are absolute stalwarts and heavyweights in the world of Irish whiskey and a must-have on all of our shelves at this stage. And uh, if you haven't yet tried a Bushmills 10-year-old or a Redbreast 12, those should be on your list to try and expand your taste buds and your palates when it comes to Irish whiskey. Uh, and I've never regretted the moment I first uh, tasted at Bushmills 10-year-old. I'll never forget tasting that. And incidentally, Redbreast was something that took me a while to get to. Uh, my palate wasn't ready for it. And I'll talk a little bit about that when I sip on the Redbreast 12-year-old. Let me know where you are joining from this evening. Uh, Kieran has got, Kieran Quinn in New Jersey already has his Tully 15 in the glass. Good man. Tony has got Bushmills Black, Black Bush in Pensacola. A staggeringly good whiskey. Uh, Bushmills Black Bush is a fantastic one. My bottle's almost empty. I've been using it for old fashions ever since Lauren McMullen uh, joined us from Bushmills a couple of months back and shared her uh, old fashioned recipe. And I've been just plowing through that bottle at breakneck speed, at COVID speed. Johnny McNally is joining us, sipping Powers Three Swallow in Windy Long Beach. It's uh, it's not windy out here in San Diego. It's uh, it's hot. It was 90 degrees today, which is, what's that, 30, 33, 34 degrees Celsius uh, and not a cloud in the sky. Um, so um, I'm, I'm going the extra mile for you now wearing a turtleneck in this heat. But it has to be done. It has to be done. We've got to keep the brand going. Amy is joining us from Gilbert, Arizona. Bushmill 16 and then Redbreast 12. Great representation there. Solid pours all together. Chris has got nothing in his glass yet. He's still working. Good stuff. Well, good luck with your work and join us whenever you're finished. Um, Cahour giving me a lovely cork welcome there, as we we expect. Cahour is here to uh, to keep it uh, keep it cork, and there'll be uh, there'll be more cork later on. We'll be putting a cork in it officially with our musical guest later. In two or three minutes, I'll be joined um, by our first guest, uh, and. Uh, from the world of whiskey, and later on we'll be joined by a guest from the world of music. But before we get started with that, I should pour a little drink into my glass. You've all got something poured in yours, so it's time for this segment. Right, and that segment, very fancy, isn't it? Um, Bushmills 10-year-old is our malt uh, that we're pouring here tonight. And Bushmills 10-year-old is a staggeringly good and staggeringly affordable uh, whiskey. I picked this up here in the United States now for uh, $44 a bottle, which is what, 37 euros um, or about maybe 30 pounds. 
Um, so what we have here is a 10 year old single malt from the Bushmills distillery, 100% made in Bushmills in Northern Ireland, uh, up on the North coast, uh, aged for 10 years in uh, predominantly bourbon casks, some Oloroso sherry casks as well, 100% uh, locally sourced barley. And this is a particularly light floral, fruity expression. Uh, we come to expect those lovely floral fruity notes from Bushmills malts, and this one doesn't disappoint. And what a fantastic entry-level malt it is for us too. Bushmills, of course, only makes in the distillery 100% malted barley. They get their grain elsewhere for their blended whiskies, but they've been focused on malt whiskey for hundreds of years now. Uh, and this 10-year-old is a lovely, lovely drop uh, indeed. So on the nose, it's immediately obvious that this is a, this is a Bushmills malt. Those unmistakable tropical fruit notes, honey, vanilla. Oh, it's absolutely lively. It's 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 bright. It's floral on the nose. Um, I was talking to Lauren McMullen during the week, who joined us a few months ago to uh, to talk about uh, the various Causeway Coast collection whiskies and a few others. And uh, I was asking her about Bushmills Ten. I said, "Have you any little bits, any tidbits, or any facts you could share with us?" And she said, shared how Helen Mulholland, the master blender at uh, Bushmills, talks about how. Bushmills 10 year old is maybe the most difficult whiskey for her to consistently make uh, and to make consistently because it's so delicate and it's so light and it's so floral. Uh, her phrase was, there's nowhere for anything to hide. So if you've got a poor batch, you've got a poor something that aged in a way you maybe didn't want it to age, there's nowhere for it to go. There's nowhere for it to hide. So keeping it consistent, keeping that light floral uh, note consistent uh, has proven uh, a challenge. Uh, so that's interesting to know. Uh, it's also another interesting fact about Bushmills 10. Wait, let me have a little sip of it first. Slaunch it. Oh, it's so light on the palate. It's so refreshing. It's so, to me, it's always that lemon meringue, honey, little hint of vanilla, but that lemony citrus and that, those wonderful fruit notes, a bit of pineapple coming through, caramel, chocolate. Oh, it's just a great value, a great value single malt. Uh, and interestingly, and purport, purportedly, this was the first ever single malt whiskey in Ireland that had the phrase single malt Irish whiskey on it, because it wasn't always called single malt, just like single pot still wasn't always called single pot still. Uh, it was called pure pot still uh, historically, and, and single malt was called uh, pure malt and old malt and various names until they were standardized through the uh, the establishment of the, the legislation that governed uh, the directives from the EU anyway on uh, on labeling. So this was the first ever whiskey from Ireland that had the phrase single malt Irish whiskey. And if we are incorrect on that, I have no doubt somebody smarter than me will correct me in the comments. But if you haven't had Bushmills malt, single malt 10 year old, you have to check it out. You have to check it out. Michael is joining us uh, with, uh, he's joining us from Vancouver. Very good. Uh, Ger Garland, uh, who is this man joining us from Kevin Teeley in South Dublin, drinking a red breast 12 year old and it's freezing. It's only one degrees. Jer, I'm very sorry for your trouble. Uh, you're more than welcome out here on the west coast of uh, the United States anytime. We'll get you a turtleneck, will we? We'll get your stories and sips turtleneck. H&M, this is the <laughs> not very expensive. I wear my $15 turtlenecks with pride. Jer, we'll be uh, moving on to Redbreast. We'll be our second whiskey tonight. You're no stranger to the Redbreast. Good man, thanks for joining us. All right, so um, with that, why don't we go about an hour and a half drive southeast from Bushmills and bring in our first guest of the evening, David Boyd Armstrong, joining us from Redeemon Estate Distillery. David, welcome. Good evening, Barry. How are we? Very good. Very good. Did I pronounce it right? I did. Redeemon oh, Estate. Yeah, full marks. Definitely got it right. We spent an hour practicing it before we came on, didn't we? <laughs> no. we got there. We got there. <laughs> David, uh, your estate distillery, your brands, your gin brands, your uh, soon-to-be whiskey brands are, to me, the best kept secrets in the world of, certainly the world of whiskey. Uh, the distillery is the best kept secret, uh, certainly, uh, as well. I don't hear enough mentions of it, and I'm hoping that we change all of that tonight. Uh, why is it such a secret? Well, I think coming, coming from up north, we're a little bit more um, reserved, a little more quiet about what we want to do. Um, we haven't got whiskey or we didn't have whiskey until two years ago. So um, we didn't feel it was right to shout about that. So we have just kept our head down and um, stayed humble and focused on what we're doing and just 
trying to make the best spirit we can. And um, we're now at a stage where we want to share that with the world. So um, we're looking forward to um, to doing that over the next few months. You're, you're one half of a, of a duo, of a team. And I'm going to uh, assume, and I, you might correct me if I'm wrong, but you are the lesser half of this team. Uh, yourself and your wife started this business a while back. Would you tell us how, how this all came about? Yeah, well, it's um, my wife Fiona. It's um, as any married man will say, and this is my bad married man's joke. It's um, it's my wife's fault. I'm in this business, but um, basically, it was Fiona's idea. She had read um, maybe twenty years ago, um, a book on the lost distilleries of Ireland. I think it was the Townsend book, and um, at that time, her parents had acquired Redemption Estate, and she had said to her father, you know, Dad, it would be great to do a distillery here. You know, we've got an estate that goes back, the house goes back to 1600s, the townland is referenced back to the, the, the late sixth century. We've got so much history here. Why don't we do this? It would be really good to bring back part of our heritage. And her dad, just as, as he will do, he just looked at her straight face and said, behave, more important things to do, get back to work. And um, that idea kind of sat until we got married back in 2011 and we had very different careers. Fiona at the time was working in property as an estates manager or surveyor, um, as more commonly known. I worked in the defense industry, um, building missiles and laser systems. Uh, so very, we had both very different careers before the drinks industry. But the one thing that we did, did have um, was that we love food and drink. And you know, in an ideal, ideal world, you know, we'd be in Bordeaux, not County Down, we'd have a vineyard, but hey, you know, County Down does not get the glorious sunshine that's needed for vines. And um, we kept having this idea of, well, we want a business, we want food and drink. And Fiona says, well, what about a distillery? And being quite gullible, I said, okay. She says, oh, we'll make gin. And um, I went, okay again. So basically the first two years of our marriage, we traveled everywhere um, from Seattle in the Northwest Pacific to Seoul and South Korea, learning about the drinks industry. And really when we were in the States, because we probably spent more time in the US than anywhere else, we really fell in love with the craft spurs movement. So if you think back to 2012, 2013, craft spurred for just really starting the boom in the US. And um, we really just fell in love with how craft distilling is done in the US. And we just went, wow, we could do something really unique if we could take that idea, that concept, and bring it home. And so in February of 13, we said, you know what, we've had enough traveling, we've had enough fun, let's get serious about this. And we ordered our first still. That still arrived from Christian Carl in July of 2013. We spent that summer developing our recipe, building the distillery, I'm putting it, trying to put all the building blocks together. And we launched our first gin then in April of 2014. Now, this <laughs> glorious picture that um, Barry has shown up is not is how things are now, but it wasn't always just as glamorous. So what you'll see here, this glass front of the piece is our still house. And to the left of that is our maturation warehouse and also our visitor center as well. And um, here it is back in the summer of 2019 when we could have had guests on site before COVID. So um, yeah, it's um, fond memories, let's just say. What was uh, was the estate a private home before it was, uh, it, or is it still a private home as well as being used as a distillery? Yeah, it's, it's, it's Fiona's parents, it's their home. Um, okay. Over the last 20 years since they acquired it, they've, it's been a labor of love to try and restore it back to its former glory. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, the house itself dates to 1607, 1608. So there's a lot of history here. Um, you know, but the estate had fallen into bad times. So her parents, has, it's very much been a labor of love restoring the house, the grounds, everything back to its former glory and the irony of it is that last year just as we were going into lockdown a spring was just turning its corner the estate was probably the most beautiful it's been for the last last 10 or 15 years so um one of the things that we have missed so much with lockdown is not having people on site 
So because we live in a, we live and we work in a special place and we just want to get back to sharing that with people. What's it like living in the same place where you work? You can never get away with it. Is there enough land to hide behind a tree or climb a tree to get away with it? Get away from it all. Oh, there's plenty of there's plenty of places to hide, but I'll, I'll get, you know, the benefits outweigh the negatives. You know, um, you know, like during lockdown, you know, we've had our own space where we've been able to things that we wouldn't have had the opportunity to, and um, you know, it, it's you know. It, you know, I can say it's bad, you know, you're too close, all those acronyms that you're never away from it. But you know what? We couldn't have it any other way. You left the missile world behind you for uh, something else uh, that's, uh, I suppose, a, a little bit easier to sell. There's probably a bigger market for, for gins and whiskeys than there are for missiles, I'd say, are there? Uh, definitely at the minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a, like, I, I was very, in my case, I was very fortunate. I was a, with a company... Um, I'm one of the Belfast apprentices. Um, I was with a company since I was 16 till I was 33. So um, I had 17 fantastic years. But, um, you know, sometimes you just feel you have to do something different. And um, when we started to, started this project, I have to say that, you know, ultimately we fell in love with this idea of creating a distillery and trying to bring back part of our heritage. I suppose in in the North, Northern Ireland, whatever way you want to put it, it's most distilling it. It's the saddest story. You know, you go back to 1908 and um, of the 12 million gallons of whiskey produced on the island of Ireland, 8 million of that was exported from the North. You know, and the sad thing is in the space of two generations, with the exception of Bushmills, we lost all of that industrial heritage. So just to be part of that, to be bringing that back, it's, it's just fantastic. And what a time to be part of it. There's no shortage of neighbours, distilling neighbours now within a, a stone's throw of you. Yeah, oh, oh, the, Jesus, this this part of County Down where we've got the guys at Ecklinville, the guys at Hinch, ourselves, you know, and, and a few others along the way. It's, we actually are probably closest to having a proper distillery tour than anywhere else on the island. It's just, you know, you know you're no more than 10 to 15 miles, if even between, the, between those three distilleries, 20 miles if you include the others so it's it is it is really really exciting you know and you know in our case we're only 30 minutes from belfast so you know we're we're accessible as well which is a key part for that whole tourism piece aside from the labor of love of restoring an estate and, and building a a distillery what was that learning curve like to go from missile defense to distilling how did you go about it where did you even start well, I suppose for us, we recognize at the very, very beginning that we don't know, we're not from a food and drink background. We're not from the drinks industry. So the first thing we actually did was we we signed up and done the um, fundamentals of distilling course with the Institute of Brewing and Distilling in London, which was fantastic. It's the only course where you got, I've ever been on where you got free beer at lunchtime. <laughs> so it got full marks. Uh, but but it was fantastic, you know, and we got to visit uh, um, some distilleries in London as well. We got to meet some fantastic friends that are in the industry from John Hilgren at Herno Gin to Ian Chang at um, Kavalan Distillery in Taiwan. And um, it was a fantastic experience. And then we've done some hands-on courses as well, one of which was at Michigan State in the States. And... Um, you know, we, we, we just, we put the hard miles in. We, you know, we went and we went and we'd done our hard work. We, we went and we learned, you mm -hmm. know, you're not an expert overnight. And at the same time, no amount of theory will cover what you've got to do when you've got your own plant. You know, you've got to learn how that plant talks, how it behaves, what way it's going to, going to react when you do something, type of spirit it's going to do. So, you know, every day is a school day, but that's, that's the fun of it. You mentioned the United States being a big influence. Were there particular distilleries, brands that just you had stuck in your head that you just couldn't get out of your head? You were inspired by them as you were thinking about what to do in the estate? Okay, I think from at all levels, from the New York Distilling Company with that sort of really edgy urban approach to things through to, you know, the other extreme, the very polished, and I say polished literally, the concrete floors of Westlands, and the beautiful setup they have there in, in Seattle. And in their case, their approach to the Virgin Oak, to the Gary Anna Oak. And 
sort of that sort of left field of thinking in terms of what American malt whiskey could be is um I, I, I just think it's all very, very inspirational. And the irony is the distilleries that we visited last were actually the distilleries in Ireland. Mm. You know, and I suppose in one way that's probably been a, a benefit because we just haven't thought about things in the traditional way. We've thought about things by the well, we're gonna be small, so how do small distilleries actually produce great products? And that's a different way of thinking from trying to emulate what the big guys do. You mentioned the idea, this mad idea, uh, your wife's idea. Let's start a distillery. Uh, it's 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 a fantastic idea in in the dream world, and 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 then it gets on paper, and then the reality hits, and you see how expensive it is and how long it's going to take. But was the plan always to only distill gin, or was there something else in the back of your mind as well? I suppose when we when we ordered our first still, we wanted it to be flexible enough to allow us to do to do whiskey. And um, the first still we ordered was from Christian Karl um, in Germany. And we can run that as a pot still or as a pot column still. So it was always going to give us that versatility. But um, just before we launched Short Cross Gin, we were at the American Distilling Institute conference in Seattle. And um, we got to visit Westland, Copper Works, um, Mayhem Distillery, and a few other small distilleries. But it really realized to us or really show to us, you know, whiskey can be made at a very big scale, but it can also be made at a very small scale. And we sort of looked at each other, you know what, and, and said, you know, if we're going to do this, we're going to need more than one product. And we're great believers in life that if you're going to do something, you either make what you love or you do what you love. And I just so happened that I had started to fall in love with um, single malt whiskey. And um, we said, OK, well, how are we going to do malt whiskey? And the answer we got back was, well, we need to be able to make a beer because essentially whiskey is distilled beer, less the hops. And um, that's where the whiskey journey sort of picks up. So before we get to that whiskey story, and I want to dive into that, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I'm curious about it. The gin. So tell us about you, you, the name of the distillery and the name of the gin are two different names. Uh, talk us through. Um, so here we have a picture of the gin, short cross gin, a picture of the stills. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, give us the the origin, help us understand, David, the origin and the etymology of the name of the estate and where Shortcross comes from. Yeah, so the estate itself is actually one of the oldest referenced estates in the island of Ireland. Um, it goes back to, I think it's 590 or 592. It was an area that was granted to the, um, the son of a Gaelic king called Damon, and it was called the Wraith of Damon, Wraith Damon, which is why we say we're Damon. But that's only part of the story. The name Short Cross, though, comes from our local village, which is called Crossgar. And Crossgar in Irish or in Gaelic means the Short Cross. So we're proud to have our village name on each and every bottle of our gin. So yes. And then on our bottle screen for you there. There yeah. you go. So on our, our gin bottle, we have the a penny emblem, which is a short cross penny. And that was actually the first coin to be minted in Dublin by the Normans in the 13th century. Um, and it was really done as a way of exporting Irish silver. So for us, it was just the perfect way of tying in our logo and our brand name, because from the start we knew we would want to export our products because that's where the, the great opportunity is. Since Dingle broke ground back in, what was it, 2012 or yeah. around that time, um, and reinvigorated this this craft industry and, and, and distilling that you speak so fondly of that you saw in the United States and elsewhere. Um, they had this model of making their gin and their vodka locally, paying the, the bills, keeping the lights on for long enough to get their, get their whiskey to market. Other distilleries will have a different approach where they might source whiskey to sell. Uh, they may also make gin or they may not. Um, you took a decision to not source any third-party spirits while your own spirits age yeah well look you know i have i have no issues with that and i you know and um, people do fantastic things with that but for us we want our whiskey to be our short cross whiskey and um also you know if i look back then what would i have known about whiskey other than a consumer so you know i think you got to do the miles you've got to learn the trade you've got to learn the differences the subtleties in it all you know and you know, that, that was just a decision that, that we made. And um, 
you know, we make gin because we love gin. We're not making gin to pay for whiskey. You know, if I didn't like gin, I wouldn't have the Twitter handle Lord of Gin. You know, you know, it's, <laughs> we just we just love what we do um, on the gin side. You know, we've had a lot of fun. It's great that we're seeing our seeing our gin now in the states in Pennsylvania. Um, you know, but um, for us, you know, with our whiskey, we wanted to make our whiskey first, first and foremost, to show that we knew we could do it and show that we can actually craft a great spirit in the first instance. That's and for us, our focus is on about creating great spirits. You know, I I'm not worried if I make pot still whiskey, malt whiskey, or whatever. I just want to make great whiskey. That's that's our objective on the whiskey side. The the gin has been picking up awards, uh, and I, I, I and thanks for the clarification and, and that emphasis on the fact that the manufacture of gin or the production of gin is not just uh, to keep the lights on to pay for something else. It is a, a in itself a pursuit and an initiative, and 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 uh, and the same with Dingle. In fact, uh, it just so happens to pay the uh, to pay the bills at the same time. Um, tell us about the gin production process because many distilleries new distilleries, they've got column stills, they've got gin stills, they've got pot stills. Help our audience understand, perhaps at a very top level, rudimentary level, how is gin made uh, differently compared to, to whiskey? Okay, I, I suppose for us, if I talk about what we do for Short Cross, the key for us is that we wanted to create a gin that reminded us of our home. You know, we're set within 500 acres of forests and beautiful gardens. And we wanted to try and, and capture that. So we forage four of our key botanicals um, from the estate. So we take elderflowers, elderberries from the forest. We take wild clover from the lawns and we take apples from the wall garden. Um, and those four botanicals are all about trying to create a sense of terroir with our gin and link our gin back to our home. And with that, then we combine juniper, coriander seeds, citrus peels, cinnamon and cassia and we actually use our own water as part of the process and we distill that then um, on the the 450 liter copper pot still there that you see but we pass the spirit through the two enrichment columns which for us when we distill gin actually help us build more flavor and aroma into the spirit um, as we distill it so you know, they're, they're a key part for us and they almost work in the inverse of what people associate columns doing for whiskey. So rather than lightening the spirit for us, they actually add weight and flavor and aroma to it. What, how long of a process is the, is it to make a, a batch of gin then? Uh, is it, and, and how much does that vary compared to how long it takes for a batch of whiskey? Uh, look, our gin takes, you know, a day or two to do, the, to do a batch and then a couple of weeks to do the bottling side. You know, but that said, we have we do a lot of aged gin. So we actually done mm. a, a gin that we aged for two and a half years in an ex cognac cask, um, which is an absolutely fantastic sipping gin, just over ice, the way you enjoy any good matured spirit. Um, but it's it's just different from our from our whiskey, and even I suppose for us, when, when one of the big differences when we produce whiskey compared to maybe a lot of other places, we're fascinated with fermentation. fermentation. You know, um, for me, setting aside mash bills, which was something that we love and we do a lot of, ex a lot of experimentation with, for us, fermentation is the key process. You know, you take your typical distillery, um, you know, you see fermentation periods of 60 to 72 hours. Our normal fermentation is 140 to 168 hours. So we're, really pushing the boundaries on that where we get a lot of secondary fermentation mm -hmm. which creates more flavor and we see that consistently now when we distill the spirit we just get a much greater array of flavors and aromas and our spirit is so much better for that when i interviewed the team at waterford distillery when we did our podcast together to talk about terroir and where it, how it exhibited itself through the different processes of of uh, of whiskey production there was a lot of talk about the low and slow approach to both fermenting and distilling in Waterford and especially on the fermenting side, this, these longer uh, fermentations where the team at Waterford were very firm to say that this is where flavor is created. This is where flavor is, it, 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 that ultimately gets gets concentrated through the distilling process, but we have to get the flavor right here at fermentation. If we don't, there's no way to create that flavor later on. 
Yeah, look, you know, your first 48, 60 hours creates ethanol, you know, and um, beyond that, you start to add flavor. So the longer you give it, the more flavor you get. Now, you will lose a little bit of alcohol or yield on the alcohol, but what you get back in flavor is so much more important, you know. We are never going to be the world's biggest sister. We are not going to be Bushmills or Middleton in my lifetime, you know, but that's just a volume thing. My ambition is to produce the best Irish whiskey I can, or the best whiskey I can, and fermentation is so key to that because that's where we can have a difference. That's where we can get more flavors and aromas, and then how we craft that when we distill the spirit allows us to pick out the flavors and aromas we want, you know, so that's what it's all about. So here's where the magic happens then on the whiskey side of things. Um, talk us through your, your your whiskey setup in the distillery. It is a pot still that was fabricated for us by the guys at Frilly. We have produced the design of it. What's a little bit unusual um, compared to a lot of distilleries is you'll see that we use a upwardly ascending line arm, which without sighting like too much of a geek, um, allows us to produce really full bodied spirit but also to focus on getting because we double the still means we'll get a full bodied spirit but the upwardly point in line arm means we get a lot more floral and estuary notes coming through on our, our distillers as well and the beauty of our distillery is i can actually use this still for both my wash and spirit distillation or i can pair it up with the pot still elements of my two carl stills so uh, you know we're, we're very very flexible in our setup but for us, the key thing with all of our stills is outwardly pointing line arms and really high quality copper because copper has such a big role in producing great spirits. You know, you see a lot of a lot of distilleries with maybe some some alembic stills, uh, but for us, the pot stills are really key. You know, it's and it's also it's the centerpiece of what we do. We show off when we do our tours. Ed reckons it's probably some high tech wicking fabric from NASA you're using. What with all the <laughs> defense missile approach uh, is there anything uh, hidden in there no <laughs> <laughs> no there's no nano particles or anything like that <laughs> <laughs> you know i <laughs> no no similar materials no 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 weapons grade weapons grade stills or or, or <laughs> copper no that, that's top secret i can't tell you that <laughs> <laughs> actually no we're the most secret of the still be out there so <laughs> Yeah, that's right. We wouldn't know what you got hidden in, inside those uh, inside those uh, those rooms at all. When you set out to distill, then you had a style of whiskey in mind, did you? Um, obviously, when you're you started to design the the still house and the stills, you needed to to have some sense of what you wanted to end up with, presumably. Yeah, look, um, I got into I got into whiskey with a tasting at uh, Belfast International Airport of the original Connemara Turfmoor. Um, which was the original super smoky expression that unfortunately you can't get now. And um, I like quite smoky, quite I, I like barbecue food. So to me, this was just a real revelation of the sweetness and the smokeness and how it married. So from the start, when we said, okay, we're going to look at whiskey, I wanted to do peat. Not everything is peat, but definitely peat as part of what we wanted to do. And looking at the process, you know, if you're producing a peated whiskey, the peat element is most soluble as the alcohol in the, in the spirit still decreases. So that meant straight away we were going to look at double distillation. Um, and we just felt, you know what, there's not enough people doing double distillation in Ireland. And we felt it would be a unique point for our products. Um, you know, we can do triple distillation and we are, are in the process of doing some trials. But what I like about double distillation was you get such a broad range of flavors and you get a, get what I like, which is a much fuller bodied whiskey. That is, you know, so that, that, that was, that was simply the science behind it. And also at the very start, it was only myself in the still house. So I had to think about how much I could actually do, you know, right. you know, yeah. you know I can't <laughs> run the three stills. Two, two, one or two is okay, but three would be probably too much in a day. There's only, there's only one of you. Um, we got a lot, a lot of peat fans. Uh, I'm, I'm increasingly becoming accustomed to and acclimatized to, to peat. And um, 
I wouldn't say people are forcing it down my throat, but they're very kindly introducing me to peated whiskies in, 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 in an effort to broaden my, my amateur palate. And uh, I'm getting there slowly but surely uh, and enjoying the journey. The, um, the whiskey then has been sleeping for quite a while then because you've been in business for how long now? Is it seven years you've been in business? Yeah, we were seven years since we launched our gin, and it's almost six years since our first cask of whiskey were laid down. So, you know, we've just quietly kept our heads down. You know, what what people don't realize is that almost every year that we've had a major building project from build, build, getting our first the first part of the still house up and running, getting our bottling hall, our fizzer center, our maturation warehouse one, maturation warehouse two, and as I now look at that maturation warehouse three, so you know, that all they're all building blocks to where we want to get to on, on this on this journey. And um, I should add the the lovely glass box as well at the front of the distillery, as we call it, that houses one of our stills as a showcase. These all take time and effort to plan, to organize, to coordinate. So while we have been very quiet, we've also been really really busy, and uh, and. It's what we've actually been doing now there's not any uh commercially available uh peated malt in ireland is there currently uh, at, a, at a scale that's 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 sufficient there's 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 only a, there's only three distilleries that are viably producing it ourselves um Cooley and, and great northern you know um for us when we first looked to try and source peated malt um I spoke to Alan Dempsey as he was in his role then. It was at um, Minch Malt. Alan just laughed at me. He says, you're crazy. No one wants peated Irish whiskey. And I went, that's okay, but I want peated malt. So eventually he said, okay, I can get it in for you. So we were able to get it in, get it crushed and whatever else and send up to us. And um, it was a bit of a revelation because I think I don't think people appreciate that in Ireland, if we hadn't done that for the small producers, you weren't getting peated malt. Yeah. You know, it wasn't until someone showed actually an interest and a demand for it that actually that was that was actually going to happen. The big guys could always get it because, you know, they, they have the space and the capacity for it. And, it. and it'll make sense for the monsters to supply them. But for the small guys, it wasn't happening. So, you know, in our case in the north, we're the first distillery in over a generation to produce peanut malt. And that's quite a big thing for us. And we're quite passionate about that. Not too far away from you, another estate distillery, Ecklandville, uh, is uh, there. They've got a quite a, a cradle to grave operation in terms of uh, from growing the barley all the way through to, to to sending it out into the world. You you're you yourselves having an estate surrounding the distillery. Is are there plans afoot at all to grow your own barley, or will you source from outside? It's on the radar. Um, we are a full working farm um, between beef cattle, um, thoroughbred horses, and everything else in between. Um, we have a fairly busy farm. I would love to do it. It's an argument that I'm slowly winning, um, but it, it's on the radar, definitely. 100% is something that we want to do. Has Brexit affected you at all negatively in terms of your plans to export or with your distribution plans? <sighs> Well, well, well I'll be, I'm on record as being um, a remainer, so I'll, I'll be careful how I say this. Um, like it's it's just for us, it's just it made life more difficult. Um, mm. It could have been a lot worse, is what I'll say. It's not great, but it could have been a lot worse. So, um, thankfully, it hasn't impacted us in the way that we were looking at maybe at the end of 2018 into into late 2019. So, you know, um. Okay. We'll we'll wait and see. I think the I think um, I think I still think that we're too early into the post Brexit period to really understand everything that how, is how it's going to impact everything. I know. That's why I put that in. That's a very suitably diplomatic and informative answer at the same time. Uh, we appreciate it. <laughs> um, tell tell us, David, about the whiskey then, because it's been sleeping for what you say almost six years. There have been some sneak peaks of this whiskey. It started popping up uh, in no less, no no fewer, no smaller places than on television. People have seen your whiskey and have taken screen grabs of, of bottles of your whiskey. Yet nobody else in the world has seen your whiskey. What's going on with the whiskey? Okay, well, I'll start with a screen grab. Um, so 
obviously this week has seen um, on local television has seen the Great British Menu, um, which is where a number of um, regional competitions are held to for chefs to participate in this um, in this um, Great British Menu competition. And this has been the Northern Ireland heat. And um, before Christmas, one of the chefs reached out to us and they wanted to use a new local Irish whiskey. So um, our whiskey ended up being used in the menu and being very well received. Um, but the bottle that everyone has seen is actually a very early iteration of the design. So um, sorry to be a spoiler, guys, but it ain't the final bottle and you're going to have to wait and see what it's going to be. But um, yeah, we've, we've just gradually started to talk more and more about what we've done. Um, for a long time, we kept the peat element very, very quiet. Um, you know, but as Pete has become so, excuse me, so hip almost, you know, um, we just felt, you know, we've been distilling it from 2016, you know, it's about time that we actually talked about it. And, um, you know, I'd say our first cast went down in the summer of 2015. So really it, it's just time for us to start saying a little bit about more about what we do. Everyone knows that we do malt whiskey, which we've been laying down from 15. But also we've been help and advice from, from Dave Quinn at Irish Distillers. We've also been able to lay down some fantastic single pot still whiskey. And um, we have something else in our back pockets that we're not talking about for now. So um, trust I'll me. Go no, I'm not my mom. <laughs> it's me as a secret service. So you have a good job of getting it out of me. Um, <laughs> And you know, which is and the third distillate is something that I'm really, really excited about. Um, it's it's very different from from what a lot of people have done, and a lot of people struggle with this distillate. So I'm not going to say any more. And then, of course, we have one of Finan O'Connor's um, great experiments. So um, hopefully, we're going to find out a little bit more about that come June or July of this year. So what can you tell us about, so Fionnall O'Connor, uh, renowned uh, whiskey historian and academic in Ireland, he, he wrote the seminal book on Potsdam Whiskey, A Glass Apart. Uh, he's been a guest uh, on our podcast. He's, a, he's a, a good member of our group and a great wit and contributor at every opportunity. Uh, he's at the moment exploring historic mash bills with Bowan Distillery, uh, which is a, a fairly publicly uh, known and, and, and um, available project. But now you're saying, that he may have also been dipping his toe into Redeeming Estate as well. Oh, he certainly has. He certainly gave us a little bit of inspiration, but I can't say too much more because I don't want to steal his thunder. But um, if you're interested in Belfast, this uh, Belfast historic whiskey, this is going to be something that's going to pique a lot of people's interest. So it is. So, um, and it's something we're looking forward to the sharing with people as well. Well, you're going to have to come back and share it with us when you have more to tell us and uh, maybe some, something that we can put. We can put in our glasses as well. Uh, Fanon's a great, uh, love the work that Fanon does and, and fascinated by the historical mash bills. And yeah, I mean, like you said at the start, the, you're sitting on a treasure trove of historical information and uh, just whiskey history. Northern Ireland, just, I mean, uh, the amount of whiskey that was exported out of out of that part of the country was unbelievable. Okay, it's, it's, it's sad in so many respects that we, that we lost that heritage, but at the same time, it's, inspiration will see how locally we have embraced the industry and we're trying to bring it back and everyone is trying to bring it back with their own angle on it but everyone's trying to bring it back in the right way you know um i think you know the big projects um like ourselves and, and the others you know we're, we're we're committed to the cause we want to do it right we want to see quality you know it, it's not a get rich quick scheme as um I think as John Tilling says, you know, the biggest way to make a small fortune in whiskey is to start with a large fortune. <laughs> right. you, know, yeah. um, so, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of that is out there. So it is. I, you know, we've, we've been distilling whiskey from 2015, so we're still only at the start of this this journey. So it is, you know. When you talk about your peat and malt, there's, there's lots of people get interested in in, in peat. Um, Peter Galbraith in Dublin wants to know what phenols level you achieve. So, what parts per million is this a an octomore level of peat, or is it a light a lighter level of peat? Well, I'm not. I, I don't know the finished level yet because we haven't bottled it. But um, it's certainly on the medium to high level. No, not octomore high because that's just ridiculous. But um, it's proper smoky. Let's just say. Ah. The world is got the Irish whiskey world is getting smokier and smokier by the day. We can't move for smoke. 
Well, you know, if, if you think about it, tell me somewhere in Ireland that we don't have Pete. Tell right. me someone who hasn't had their grandparents, been in their grandparents' house and, and smelt the peat, lo- the peat turf on the fire, you know. It's, it, it's, it's part of our nature. It might not, be, might not have always been part of our whiskey over the last hundred years, but go back yeah. far enough, it certainly was. My childhood was uh, was was uh, scourged with having to go out to the the garage and bring in bales of briquettes, the turf, the the peat briquettes, bring them into the fire every night out in the cold and lift these heavy briquettes that probably weigh, weighed as much as I did as a small child and bring them in. But the the smell and that 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 transports me back instantly to my childhood. And um, some people say turf and peat is for the fire, not for the whiskey. But I think you disagree, and others would disagree as well. Yeah, no, look, with the. We wanted to do peat at malt because it, to me, peat is just so beguiling. You know, you, it's like going down the rabbit hole with whiskey. You know, um, if you if you like that sort of smoky element, it can be heavy smoke, it can be light smoke, it can be that unaminess that just brings flavors and aromas together. Yes. It is such a fantastic element of whiskey, and um, hell, we've even tried it with pot still as well. You know, so. Um, you know, not an awful lot, but we have we have a little bit of pot still there as well with, with some smoke in it. And you know, it's it's a component. You know, it's 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 just it's just one of those things. And I say we want to innovate, so it's it's part of what we want to do with our whiskies here. Al wants to know uh, what casks are you maturing the whiskey in? Then, well, that's a good question. I'm not going to tell you. Yeah, look, look we use <laughs> bourbon, we use sherry, uh, but we use other things as well, and. and and people are just going to have to wait and find out, you know. Um, you know, I, I like in our whiskey is, is to, you know, this is like a like the trailer to a movie. There's no point in me giving you the plot now because you'll not watch the film, you know. So you, you it's it. easy to t- it's easy to tell you worked in the defense industry. You're, you're keeping all these secrets. You have nothing to share with us. It, um, I, you're I, neither I, confirming nor denying anything. Look, <laughs> <laughs> like, I will confirm we're making great whiskey. You know, and that, I do know what it's it's a, it's a great time to be involved with Irish whiskey. You know, you know we'll, we've seen it with the the GI how Irish whiskey is being protected. We're seeing moves to open up technical files and diversify what we're doing. You know, it's very very exciting times. You know, and, and you know the industry is also it's really collective how it supports everyone. You know, so it's just there's just so much good things happening out there. You know, when. We were talking before we went live tonight. I, sh- I was shaking this bottle of Bushmills in front of you and said, well, that's what I'll be drinking to begin with. And you said, well, I've got my own bottle of whiskey here. I'll be drinking. And you waved a bottle of whiskey in front of the camera and you've been keeping it very quiet there since. What's, what's, what have you got in that bottle now? You have to tell us what's that. Yep, so this is a three and a half year old, double distilled, single pot still. Um, roughly 40% raw barley, 60% malt. Um, aged in this case first full bourbon and um it's actually a cast that most people who have visited the distillery on our tours have actually smelt because it was this cast that were in our our still house for their tours and um i can confirm that it now tastes as well as it smelt you know um it's really sweet full body those lovely pot still spices um and if i'm honest it's been in the cast for three and a half years and i haven't tasted it until today so um I'm, I'm quite enjoying it, <laughs> I'm honest. It's progressing the way you want it to? Yeah, you know, and um, I know. Look, everyone thinks that when you have a distillery, you sit around tasting casks all day, every day, but um, it doesn't work like that. Sometimes you've just got to accept that you're putting it away and just leaving it. And, um, you know, um, thankfully I'm with a saint, so it's, um, but it's good to get a surprise. So, um, Slauncha. Slauncha. <laughs> So we have curious listeners who are wondering, well, with all this talk and non-talk and things that are not being said and things that are being said, is there any indication of when we might see a short cross whiskey on a shelf? Yes, hopefully we're going to see our first release around the middle of this year. We haven't decided well or not it will be a, a peated malt or a single malt. Um, you know, we're going to pick the best casts that we feel that are ready at that time, you know, so that's why, that's why I'm being non-committal. You know, we want, you know, we'll, we'll, when we're, when we're ready, we're, we're going to pick the right cast. We're a little bit behind because we're re-spinning some of our design work, but that's just part of the process, you know, and, um, you know, but we are going to be involved with Belfast Whiskey Week and we're really excited about that too. Uh, Paul is no stranger to us here and, uh, 
a great flag waver of Irish whiskey uh, and uh, a great commenter on posts and contributor to lots of things in our group as well. Uh, so um, people should check that out if they want to try something from yourself. Maybe get in touch with Paul, and uh, he'll he'll tell you what he'll tell you what batch or what a uh, box of whiskeys that you're part of. I presume. Yeah, I assume we're going to be in the mystery boxes. I'm not giving mystery box. Part. All right. More mystery, as if we didn't enough mystery already tonight. We, now we don't even know what box it's in in, in Belfast Whiskey Week. <laughs> Tell us about the tours then. When so Northern Ireland joyously uh, opened up to a degree again this week, and uh, I know there's people out in beer gardens around Northern Ireland tonight raising glasses and toasting each other safely. Is the plan to have a full-on tour experience when that's safe to do so? Yeah, when it when it's safe to do so, definitely we. We'll Definitely open the bar at the distillery um, over the summer months. Tours, because they go into our production areas, we're going to wait and see how everything pans out. When it's safe to do so, we'll we'll be bringing tours tours back. But first step for us is is getting the bar open, getting people up for cocktails, gin masterclasses, whiskey masterclasses as that comes along, and um, tours hopefully will follow that. You know, we just. You know, we're a small team, so we just got to take it by time, you know, and, um, you know, we have a lot happening as well. So for us, our focus is get to summer, get our whiskeys out, get the bar open, and then we'll focus on tours later in the year. But it may be 2020, you know, 2022, as it's going to be before we're fully back to doing okay. tours. Maybe a few uh, socially distanced yurts in the in the fields there that we could uh, fall into and go to sleep in the yurt after a, a few whiskeys or gins, maybe. Yeah, you know, it's plenty of bollocks to keep your company, you know. But <laughs> <laughs> Was there any point in the last seven or eight years now as you embarked on this journey and gave up your jobs, was there any point where you thought, this was mad, ridiculous, like, what are we doing? I th there was one night when we were doing the commission for our whiskey in June of 2015, and we got a blocked heat exchanger. It's half one at night. You've been there from seven and you're just going, good God, can it get any worse? <laughs> you know, but you know what? You just sometimes you call it quits, you get a couple hours kip, you come back in, you fix the problem and you get on with it. You know, it's not easy. You know, anyone thinks it's an easy business, it's a sexy business. Um, it might be okay if you're working for someone, but when it's your own business, it's so close to your heart, you know, it's, you know, it's it's your life. It's your life and blood. You know, so um, so yeah. Sometimes you get frustrated. Sometimes you like anyone else. We get bad days, but you gotta love what you do. And we have had so many ups. We've had so many downs. But for us, this is going to be a big year because we're going to bring out some things that are a little bit unique, a little bit special. And you know what? It's it's going to be our part to tell our history of our whiskey this year in 2021 and that's important for fiona and i you, Everyone, you have us excited and teased at the same time and uh we're on the edge of our seats so why don't i ask this a different way what is it that you'd like to be known for as a whiskey producer is there some is there a dna that you'd like to point and say that's ours i think people will see <laughs> one thing that has become apparent is is there are certain characteristics across our malt our peanut malt our pot still and our other distillates that will shout redemption. We we know that now because we've got now got mature distillates of just about everything bar Fanon's experiment. So we're key with that. But why I want people to make, remember us as being makers of great Irish whiskey. That's that's the key. We want to be renowned as being being a good producer, uh, if not a great producer. And you know, and I have every confidence that we will be we it will be and we are a great producer of Irish whiskey. Um, we just want to be able to tell that story now to the world. I know there's so much, well, I don't know, but I'm, I'm reading between the lines here. I can tell that there's so much more that you're not telling us than you're telling us, and that's fine. Uh, you've got to come back and tell us when you can. Yeah, well, look, the one thing that we, we, we don't talk about is that um, even my wife, Fiona, she's the only lady um, who is the managing director, founder of an independently owned Irish whiskey distillery. Mm. You know? You know, and that that in its own right deserves credit because there's so been a lot, of, there's a lot of great talk about women in whiskey. You know, it's great to see Helen Mahal and the Bushmills get their recognition um, as as yep. one example. But you know, um, 
my wife Fiona, she'd actually stay out of the limelight, but she's the inspiration for all this. You know, if it wasn't here, I'd still be building missiles, you know. So, <laughs> you know <laughs> I'd still play all, all the double agent stuff, you know, but um, but she's the key because she this is her heart and soul in this project as much as mine, you know, and um she'll she'll tell her side of that in due course. We'll slaunch it to Fiona and hopefully when we get over to Ireland and we get up to the north and, and, and touring around the distilleries, we'll get to, we'll get to meet and, and toast you all with a, with a gin and a, and a whiskey uh, when, when the time is right. But uh, kudos uh, to both of you for, for what you've done. You've, you've, I'm, I'm surprised at what I've learned about what you've been doing and I'm sure many others in the audience too are surprised at just the scale and the breadth of what you're undertaking. And it has been a well-kept secret. And the only reason you're here tonight is because um, I managed to see a tweet from you talking about hinting at something coming in the whiskey world. And I said, well, come on, come on the lock in and Stories and Sips and tell us about it. And, uh, and, and a week and a half later, here we are. <laughs> Otherwise, we wouldn't yeah. know. Well, look, since we filled our first cast back in 2015, it's been, um, the whiskey journey has been fun and event-filled. Um, you know, I'm, I say we just we just want to get it out there, you know. You, can, you can't imagine, you know. I know that you're saying I'm teasing and everything else, but look at it from our side. I have all this these whiskey casts. I walk into our warehouse and I'm looking at them, and each one has a story, and I just want to tell that story now. And that's where the fun's going to be, you know. Well, we can't wait to hear it. Um, I'm looking forward to, to tasting the whiskey. And um, you mentioned that the gin has found its way to the United States. It's in Pennsylvania. Is that right? Yeah, we're. we're the, we are working with a great importer, with Priest Imports, with Henry and Nicky, who are looking after our gin and our whiskey when it comes across. And we got listed with the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board. So um, it's great to see Short Cross. We're just humble. We're just thankful to be in the US, you know, um, and we're thankful tonight as well to, to, to be on the show, guys. So look, we really appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to talk about what we're doing here at Predemon. Well, I, I can't wait to hear more. And um, thanks a million for, for coming on and sharing some of the story and teasing that there is so much more uh, of the story to tell and many more stories. Each cask has a story. So I think we need to hear some of those stories as well. And uh, and maybe we'll get a chance to hear from Fiona at some point as well. Um, but uh, you never know. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. She's running about here with me this evening. Um, you know, she's avoiding the camera. I, I'm sitting in a certain location. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> I know the feeling. We have it. Yeah, she's um, she's sitting here laughing at me, but um, I could um, it'll it, look, it is, it's all going to come together. You know, we're we're a small team, um, but we are incredibly passionate about what we do. You know, um, you know, we 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 have got some really great things coming, and um, it's just an exciting time to be in Irish whiskey. You know, you just see the the resurgence to go from four distilleries to is it thirty six or more now? I, I can't even remember yeah. the last time I looked at the thirty nine even, yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's just it's just phenomenal, you know. You know, I don't. I think people forget it doesn't matter what part of the island it comes from, but we do food and drink so well. We do it from the heart. We love what we do, and um, I think that's the recurrent theme of Irish whiskey. You know, with it, people are passionate about it, and it's. I say it's just great to see our our national product see its resurgence now in the world market in the world. Well, we have so much to be proud of, don't we, uh, on the island in terms of food and drink, and it's it makes the storytelling easy because the, the product speaks for itself, and you just want to get it in front of people and be able to share it with them, and uh, yeah. it's it's an easy thing to share. Um, yeah. Well, look, we're going to yeah. be sharing short cross whiskey and and maybe something else with people as well over the coming months. So um, hopefully, we'll be speaking again soon, Barry. Keep us posted, David. Uh, don't don't be a stranger. Uh, don't be any more of a, a best kept secret. Uh, be the worst kept secret, please, so that we can buy some of that whiskey when it comes out. <laughs> no problem. Well, look, I look forward to sharing with you, um, in, in due course. So, look, um, thanks very much. It was great to, great to be able to speak. David, to everyone. thanks a million. Really appreciate it, and and thanks to Fiona as well. Uh, and looking forward to, to seeing you in person at some point in the future as well. So, Slauncher, thanks for joining. Okay. And um, cheers, David. Okay, Slauncher, talk to you soon. Cheers, David. Bye bye. -bye. Drain that glass, didn't I? Uh, I didn't know half of what's going on up in Redeemon Estate, and uh, I think the uh, many of you feel the same. We uh, don't go anywhere because we're about to go into our second segment. Our session kicks off. We're going to be bringing on a great musician from Cork because all the great things come from Cork, whiskey included. Um, we're also going down to Cork for our next whiskey, Redbreast 12-year-old. 
This is the next whiskey uh, that is no, you're no stranger to Redbreast 12 year old, uh, maybe the most talked about, discussed, purchased, acquired, enjoyed whiskey in our Facebook group. If you're not in our Facebook group, Irish Whiskey Fans of America, I'd love you to join because there's a great community that's building up around our, uh, our group there. There's 8,200 people in our community now and I'm seeing now on a daily basis as America starts to open up, people are meeting in person and finding ways to get together and they're sharing whiskies and, and uh, bottling up little samples for each other as they drive around the country and dropping off little care packages of whiskey. Lots of groups popping up in different regions. We have an Ohio group, we have a Florida group, Indiana group, New Jersey group, New York group, California group. So join our group, uh, Irish Whiskey Fans of America. It's on Facebook. There's no charge. Uh, there's no spam. There's no selling. It's a great community of great people. Uh, and Redbreast 12 year old, I think, is the whiskey that more people recommend when somebody asks, What should I try next? They might come to the table with a bottle of Tullamore Dew or a bottle of Jameson or a bottle of Blackbush and they'll ask, All right, I tried this, I enjoyed it, what's next? And the first thing people always recommend is Redbreast 12 year old. So I'm pouring a drop of Redbreast 12. Jer <laughs> Garland, Middleton Ambassador, is, uh, is in the audience as well, uh, sipping away on some whiskeys himself. That man could talk for 10 weeks or more about red breasts, and I'm certainly not going to try uh, and do justice to all he could talk about uh, with red breasts. But look, this is a quality whiskey. It's uh, an incredible value whiskey. Uh, I picked this up here in California now for about $53, $54, uh, which is what, about 46, 47 euros a bottle. 12 year old whiskey, as always with Irish whiskey, the age on the front doesn't tell you how old it is. It tells you how young it is. Uh, that's the youngest whiskey in there, 12 years of age. There's older whiskey, uh, perhaps, in this bottle, as there would be in other bottles too, but that's the youngest whiskey in there. Single pot still means it comes from one single distillery, Middleton, County Cork. And uh, pot still whiskey, of course, is a, a mixture of uh, malted and unmalted barley and can, on occasion uh, and legally, include other uh, grains, up to 5%, oats, wheat, rye, perhaps, but in the case of Redbreast, 100% malted and unmalted barley. Uh, a wonderful whiskey, and I'll be the first to admit, it took me a while to get into Redbreast, when I first started enjoying whiskey about six years ago, uh, properly, when I started sipping whiskey on an evening, I was sipping on Jameson Black Barrel predominantly. And I thought, that's lovely, sweet, caramel-like, had a lovely mellowness to it. I really enjoyed it. And then somebody saw that I was drinking Jameson Black Barrel and they bought me a present of a bottle of Redbreast for Christmas one year, going back now six or seven years. And I remember putting it on the shelf and uh, thinking, okay, that's lovely, that's grand. We'll get to that eventually. But right now I'm focused on my Jameson Black Barrel. Well, anyway, I finished my bottle of Jameson. And I decided, right, now's the time to pop open this red breast. I'd never had it before. And I took a sip of it and I couldn't take to it. It was too spicy for me. My palate wasn't ready. I wasn't in any way an experienced whiskey enthusiast or, or drinker at all. And it just, I couldn't take to it. Maybe it was the time of the day. Maybe it was just the moment. But I put it back on the shelf and honestly, I left it there for two years. And it wasn't until about two years later when uh, I was getting more into whiskey and I started seeing people talk about red breasts. I thought, I wonder, is that, still, is that still worth trying? And I popped open the whiskey, popped open the red breast and I took a sip of it. I remember, I still remember standing in the kitchen of my house in Ohio and sipping on the red breast 12 year old and, and looking at my wife and saying, this is amazing. How have I not been drinking this for the past few years? And it's been a slippery slope of uh, purchasing ever since of increasing expenses that go into the red breast brand as a new red breast comes out you feel like well sure you couldn't be leaving it on the shelf and so more money goes into red breast than anything else i'd say more than the utility bills in the house i'd say at this stage uh, but it's a staggeringly good whiskey and i know so many of you know red breast inside out so i don't need to tell you a whole lot about it but i'll take i'll say slaunch at you i'll take a little nose of it it's so rich on the nose Oh, it's just lovely. It smells welcoming. I get giddy when I smell it. Like there's there's something coming to me. There's uh, there's flavor bursting, waiting to get out. Uh, there's there's a juiciness, an orange, lovely orange citrus note on the nose, and it, there's no harshness. It's just it feels it feels like there's baking spices. It feels warm. It feels like there's a cake here, a liquid cake, waiting to happen. Lovely creamy now, compare that to the Bushmills 10 year old. Bushmills 10, wonderful flavor, orchard fruits, light, bright, um, vibrant flavors. And, and and quite almost like thin in terms of the, the mouthfeel. Redbreast 12 then feels like, it's like when you put that insulating foam into the wall, it kind of blows up, you know? Redbreast 12 feels like that, a pot of whiskey feels like that. You put a small bit into your mouth, it feels like there's more in there, voluminous, creamy. 
wonderful profile, wonderful. It just opens up. It opens up more and more. It kind of evolves in your mouth. Lovely dark notes, and it just goes on and on. A lovely balance between sweet and spice, and black pepper spice. Oh, wonderful whiskey. I don't need to tell you. 20 plus comments here talking about it. Johnny says, Red Breast was my introduction to single pot still. Kahur says, palate evolves over time. I hated stout when I was 23. Yeah, it's absolutely the case. Uh, my mother told me that when I was a baby, I'd sit in the high chair and eat blue cheese. Now I hate blue cheese, so it evolves the other way too. But at the same time, uh, there's other things I've come to like as well. Um, I didn't have a turtleneck on, Maureen said. Yeah, that was probably the, the reason why I didn't enjoy it back then. There was no turtleneck. Uh, all whiskey must be enjoyed with a turtleneck or um, you're just drinking vodka, apparently. Jer says... He often points out he has nothing to do with making it, but he knows the people who do, if that matters. Really enjoying the show tonight. Slauntager, um, you're a great man for flying the flag for, for Red Breast and have, uh, insti uh, have kind of inspired a passion in me into the history of, of Irish whiskey. And uh, anytime anybody uh, gets a chance to listen to Jer Garland talk about any of uh, Middleton's whiskey brands or any of uh, Irish whiskey history and his beloved Dublin and the places around Dublin that have all, uh, all have a part in Irish whiskey's history, you should you should do your best to, to, to listen to Jer because he's got unbelievable stories and great knowledge and, and an absolute gentleman. And uh, uh, it's been a pleasure of mine to, to get to know you, Jer, over the past few years. And hopefully we get to share a few pints and kyos and a few drinks and kyos over the coming months, if we can at all. All right, so let me see. Uh, before we go uh, and uh, join our next guest, and I'm very excited for the session that we have ahead of us tonight. Uh, let me look at the questions. JJ asks, Barry, do you think Barry, after I broke the seal, I left it sit for a time. It opened up to what you know it is now, uh, perhaps. But I also think that I was just a very amateur drinker of whiskey, JJ, to be honest. And uh, I don't know, is that, a, is that a good thing to be a, a more a less than amateur drinker of whiskey? Um, there's a fine line between enjoying whiskey and uh, overindulging, I suppose. But no, I think my palate just evolved, I think, to be honest. Uh, let me see. Do, 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 do. Steve wants us to have Jer back on the show to talk about the recent 2021 Red Spot release that's hit the shelves. Uh, yeah, right. We'll have to get Jer fired up, stay up for another late night, and get his Raglan Road ready uh, for us. Jer, we'll be in touch for a few a few more scoops on the air. All right. Let me see. Okay, so I'm going to be sipping on Red Breast 12, uh, and let us go to... Uh, one of our newly created segments that our next guest doesn't even know exists yet, but we put it up on the screen here now. Very important, we'll play this segment. Very fancy, put a cork in it. It's a very simple segment where we bring in a cork person and we talk about cork and we talk about uh, things related to life and music and whiskey at the same time. So without further ado, let's bring in Niall Connolly, cork man in New York. Niall, how are you? Very good, good evening everybody. Hi Barry. Um... Thanks, David, for the previous part. I really, uh, I, I, I learned a lot. I, I knew nothing, and I know more than nothing now. <laughs> and it's a good day. We can, we can, we could end today right now, having learned something. <laughs> I could, I could go to bed. <laughs> it's been when we were, when we were doing our little sound check earlier, you came on screen, and my first thought was, this is like a tiny desk concert for NPR. It looks like you're, you're, you've got the wonderful surroundings there of, of uh, books and music, and uh, it's a very learned-looking environment that you're, you're in, you're in tonight. You know, if you can't be learned, look learned. <laughs> <laughs> Niall, where, whereabouts are you in, in New York at the moment? I'm in um, Rockaway Park. Uh, for those who don't know New York, it's just a peninsula uh, um, uh, uh, in Queens, um, at the very, very, edge of, very edge of America here, um, not too far from JFK, um, but I'm, right, I'm actually right, right on, uh, on the beach. I can see the ocean out the window, and uh, I, I saw somebody, somebody commenting earlier on from Long Island saying that it was, that it was windy. I can tell you that the man, the man is telling the truth. I was out, <laughs> I was out walking with, with my two-year-old earlier on and I was thinking I should probably put a few rocks in her shoes in case she'd blow away. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, decided I, keep the, I decided to keep the rocks for myself. <laughs> she'd be great. <laughs> on account of her, she, she'd have a gentler landing because she's land lighter, you know. I'm a big heavy old man. I, I, I could have a very awkward landing, so I put the stones in my own shoes. What a wonderful world we live in where these are our considerations. You know, who, who gets the stones? What shoes, which shoes get the stones? 
Um, a few years ago, Niall, we were, uh, myself and my wife, we were, we were in Boston. Uh, my sister came over and her husband came over from Cork and we went to see uh, Glenn Hansard play in Boston. And uh, my sister pulled me aside about five minutes before the show and she goes, there's a fella from Cork, he's going to open. And I work with his brother and his name is Niall and he's brilliant. And I was like, brilliant, a Cork <laughs> fella as well. And you came on and you brought the house down. And it was, honestly now, it was a moving experience. And we've talked about it many times since myself and my wife, we've shared the story of just enjoying the song you shared um, and just feeling very connected to Ireland despite being so far away. It was a wonderful night. Thank, thanks, Barry. Um, that was, yeah, that was a, that was a very, I remember that exact moment. It was a very memorable um, evening. Um, <clears throat> I was uh, that that night. I, I I opened for Glenn a couple of times, but that night I was actually just kind of doing one song as a guest. I remember that specifically because um, it was at the uh, House of Blues in Boston, which is a massive, um, massive venue, but but put about three thousand right next to the the baseball stadium there. And um, I remember, do you remember somebody fainted at the beginning of the um, at the, right. of the concert? Somebody fainted, so the the gig was delayed by about twenty minutes, and I was thinking. And he then infamously does very long set, long performances, you know. So I was thinking, I was thinking, surely, you know, I was thinking it'd be completely understandable now if he had to drop my song because, you know, they're they're they've lost twenty minutes of the set. So I wasn't fully sure that it was going to happen, and we had discussed it beforehand, and he was going to do it after uh, a certain song of his, you know. Yeah. And uh, I say all this because I was about. He didn't do it after that song. <laughs> he didn't do it. He didn't do it after that song. And I was about eighteen hundred people from the stage when he started introducing me. <laughs> so it's the only time I've done. It's the only time I've done a done a done a performance of that size where I wasn't nervous because I was I wasn't I was too tired to be nervous because I I was trying to like push my way through eighteen hundred people to get to get up onto the stage to discuss with the bouncers they know i'm the person he's actually inviting and by the time i got to the stage glenn was like i don't know if he's here or it's like I, don't <laughs> I practically fell onto the stage with exhaustion so like i felt i felt like by the time i got up there the work was done do you know so i was, I was, <laughs> I was like i know i know how to play the song i wasn't sure that i would actually physically be able to get to the stage but now that i'm here we're fine. <laughs> it was a, it was very memorable for um, a few reasons. One of which was, uh, the, like you mentioned, the size of the venue. It was so big, and I it was one of the rare times where I'd been to a, a show of Glenn's where um, there was audience, there was members of the audience that probably weren't all there for the music. You know, they were just there for talking and having the crack, and they were making noise. I was like, what? Why are they not here for the spiritual moment? You know, like this is a, it's it's a bit of a kind of a, you know. It, it is spiritual in a way, like when you when you listen and you, you kind of tune in when you connect with music, you know. And I was very upset that there was the, all these people were talking near the bar, you know. Mm -hmm. And I remember when you came on and you started talking, and then the first chords came out, and the, there was a silence fell over the house of blues, and you had the whole you had the whole venue in the palm of your hands for that song, and it was uh, it was a rare moment. It was just a very special moment. Thanks, Barry. Um, uh, I, I, Glenn Glenn is very generous with his. Um with his uh, success, you know, like that. He really is. He does that. He does things like that all of the time, you know. I really recommend that every, everybody should have uh, at least one Oscar wedding friend, you know. Because <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> you get you get the benefits of the uh, of the stardom without any of the cost, you know. <laughs> I just have to walk off the stage and go back to the bar and nobody bothering me. <laughs> oh, the, the trappings, the trappings of Oscar glory. <laughs> but, um, but uh, I remember as well that I, I was playing in because uh, I think you came the next night too, didn't you? Down to Toad, I was playing the small little club yeah. that I play all the time. Yeah, I remember like at like the gig might have been at eight o'clock, and at half seven there was nobody there, you know. And uh, I went downstairs to the dressing room, tuned up the guitar, and I came back up at eight o'clock, and there was a line like a queue around the corner, and the bouncer says to me, "Why didn't you tell us?" And I said, "If I told you, it wouldn't have happened." <laughs> That was unreal that night. Yeah, the night after the concert, and I, it was that was another great night. We were sitting in the bar, and if there was people outside with their hands on the window looking in, <laughs> like as you were playing, like if you probably saw them from the stage, like yeah, no, I did. That was a lovely, lovely night. But I just remember that the, the, the Keith was the, the doorman there, and I just remember him. Like, and I played there, you know, I probably played there twenty times before that, and you'd get a crowd, but you wouldn't be, you wouldn't have a queue around the corner, like you know. It's like, why didn't you tell us? <laughs> 
Well, you told everyone the night before anyway to come see you that night after uh, at, 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 at the concert. No wonder they all showed up. Um, <laughs> but, um, Niall, I'm curious about uh, how you got to New York, uh, how you started music, but maybe should we kick off with an old tune before we get into the old, uh, more of a chat? Yeah, no, that seems like a good idea. And I suppose, it's, uh, I suppose I'll do the one that uh, that was an introduction uh, for you. And this is um, <clears throat> this is the song that I played that night. And this was, um, this is a song I, I, I got a, Basically, this was a, a, a challenge, somewhere, somewhere between the challenge and an ultimatum from the great um, Dublin singer Susan McKeown. Um, she was running a festival uh, in, in New York around the um, uh, 100th anniversary of 1916. So she was doing a, this, this festival, Kula. And uh, she, she invited me to, to, to come and sing a song at... Uh, um, Cooper's, Cooper U, Cooper's Union in um, New York uh, on May the 12th, which was James Connolly's 100th anniversary. And she told me, um, you know, that James Connolly had spoken there in the past and uh, and that, that, that you know, it was going to, we were going to be a whole bunch of J James Connolly scholars and a few few different artists and poets and performers. And in, in a moment of madness on the phone to her, I said, she was just asking me to come and sing something. I said, I'll write something. <laughs> And then I hung up the phone and I was immediately filled with abject terror at the prospect of, uh, you know, uh, but I know as much about James Connolly as anybody else who went to secondary school, you know, <laughs> but not, not anymore, you know, <laughs> not any more than that. And the, the possibility of uh, going to a, <coughs> sing a song about him in, in the front of a room full of scholars it just filled me with complete terror. But I chatted with uh, Susan a few more times, and she directed me to um, <clears throat> to this video. There was a video um, that R RTE had done an uh, RTE had done an interview with um, Nora Conley, James James Conley, on the fiftieth anniversary, and she directed me towards that interview, and that kind of really inspired the song, because I, I suppose <clears throat> James Conley in Irish history is such a massive. Um, Fig he's such a huge part of Irish history that you almost forget that he was a, a, just a man, do you know, in a lot of ways, you know. So I just tried to go with the the angle of, of him as a, you know, singing it from the, his wife and his daughter's perspective. And um, <clears throat> that that's the kind of the sort of the, the song is a song, song from their perspective. And um, um, then then it kind of uh, it kind of wrote itself then when I sat down with that and with the inter interview with Nora Connie. Then I, on the album, I, um, uh, I, 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 I cheekily, I'd met um, i met Javier Mass from Leonard Cohen's band through Glen at another time in Cork, and I invited him to play on it, and he played on the album recording of it. And then when I, once I had Javier, then I told Glen, oh, you know, Javier's after playing on it, you should probably throw down a vocal as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he did, and um, so that's if you any listeners want to follow up on that, they can find the the album version. But this is um, called. May the 12th, 1916, a song for James Conley. Amazing. Well, my father fought for justice for our country to be free. He was my father first and foremost. And I sat on his knee and I remember his voice and the words he said to me before my father he went down, down in history. So the mill owner to the factory girls, they'll be singing here no more. The factory girls in unison, they walked on out the door. Do not tell us when to talk, do not tell us when to sing. As long as we have voices, our voices will be king. And Nora, don't. Nor don't you cry, I have the fullest of lives. 
Well, my father, he was wounded Easter 1916 Stretched by a boy of only 14 That boy tried to take the bullets man for me As long as we have boys like that Our country will be free in Oregon nor don't you cry, I have lived the fullest of lives. At 1 a.m. on May the 12th, the message it was sent, the prisoner Connolly, his wife, an eldest daughter, does request Dublin under curfew, such a strange and sorry sight. Oh, Lily, you know that this means goodbye, but Lily, don't you cry, Lily, don't you cry, I have the fullest of lives. So the nurse, I'm bound to search you, but I do not think I can, I see that prisoner but virtuous, proud family man. There's little I can do now, do what I can. They carried my wounded father, tied him to his final chair, said, Father, I'll wish you. For your killer, say a prayer well. My father fought for justice, for all workers to be free. He said a prayer for all men who must do their duty. And Lily, don't you cry. Lily, don't you cry. I have lived for the fullest of lives. Oh, Lily, don't you cry. Lily, don't you cry. I have lived the fullest of lives. Said my father to the factory girls, your cause is just and right. It's a battle we won't win, but a battle we must fight. When you go back, hold your head high. And sing your song out proud that it might echo a hundred years from now. And Lily, don't you cry. Lily, don't you cry. I have lived the fullest of lives. Oh, Lily, don't you cry. Lily, don't you cry. I have Fullest of lives. Oh, Lily, don't you cry. Lily, don't you cry. I have lived the fullest of lives. Oof, it's beautiful. Thank you, Barry. Beautiful, beautiful. Melinda in the corner clapping away. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Amazing. Um, so many great comments. Wow, brilliant. Beautiful song, Niall. Haunting tune. Maureen giving it uh, lots of hearts. Um, this is amazing, says Chris. Big Thanks. bool of us and heartstrings uh, being pulled on um, around uh, around America tonight with this one. Remarkable. Mark Ashley. Um James Connolly would not be very familiar to many Americans. He, he he's uh, he's not the, the the front and center uh, character of the 1916 um, rising and and early Irish independence, but he played a huge role, and would be well known the trade union movement, obviously in Ireland, and and, and the work he did for workers. Um, Absolutely. Um, so for those who do not know, I suppose yeah, he was one one of the leaders of the 1916 rising, and he was wounded in the. Um, in the in the wounded on in the rising and he had, he had to be um i suppose the very uh 
striking image that sticks with all of us who studied about him is that he he had to be tied to the uh, to the chair for his execution. So I always thought that was such a and like carried to his execution. I always just thought that was such a. I remember even as a child just thinking that mixture of um, like the you know the tenderness of carrying somebody with the violence of like carrying them to towards their um, execution. You 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 were familiar with my music, Barry, before inviting me in to do a Friday night, right? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to. I thought you were going to lift our spirits. You're bringing them way down now, like he, he, he did. Apparently, like he's apparently thought that you know he did say to to Lily, his wife, like I have lived a full life, you know. So yeah. there's that too, like. But um, what a contrast! Like that. That to me is the the juxtaposition of the the calm. I've lived a full life. You go on. Be, you'll be fine. You live your life. I've done my work. I have to yeah. go now, but you know, yeah. I feel like I've, I've accomplished something. Yeah, yeah. It was especially especially when when at that point. Nothing had yet been accomplished, you know. It was just so sort of, it's absolutely brutal, but a but a very yeah. very striking um striking image and a, a, like a, I suppose the other thing that I learned later is just just how much work he had done for um for trade unions, not just in Ireland but also in his in his native Scotland and indeed all of, all over the states. Like he, uh, I talked about a, I I I. I I remember playing in Chicago one time and talking about being nervous performing in in, in front of the the James Conley expert and this fella came up to me after he says like, you'll never guess what I do he said I said what do you do he says I'm the head of the Chicago James Conley Association <laughs> <laughs> I said did I get a pass he says you got an A I was like okay good <laughs> isn't it amazing that what what an outsized uh, outsized impact a human can have a hundred years after their passing that there are organisations and associations named absolutely. yeah absolutely yeah. and um, I suppose, um we the, in so many fields ireland uh, um ireland uh, in terms of exports from from whiskey to music to poetry and literature like for the size of the country it is astounding how much uh, how much of an impact um uh, ireland has had uh culturally and politically in the world oh it is yeah, yeah. it really is especially cork <laughs> I was going to say Ireland and Cork. <laughs> Ireland and Cork, yeah. We, we tell people from Cork first, then Ireland second. Um, it, Niall's website is hilarious. When you go to the about section on Niall's website, it says this. I was a guinea pig for a medical research company. In 2001, I took some tablets. They took some blood. They gave me 500 old Irish pounds. I took the money to the credit union and they gave me two grand. I made my first album, Songs from a Corner, on credit union records. My first album paid for my second which paid for my third. I now have eight studio albums, a live album, an EP, and a human child. Um, <laughs> how did those tablets affect you? Had you had any long-term effect on those tablets? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, was, I, was, I was apparently on course to become a very success, successful accountant before I... Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, no, it was, it was a place there and... Um, I actually did it a couple of times. Is the one story. There was a place there in, um, on uh, called Shandon Clinic on Dominic Street in Cork City, and they oh, would you did this in thing. Cork. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, right. And they um, they would do these uh, clinical research trials. They assured me they were for things that were already on the market that just needed to have their license renewed. But uh, I've become a little skeptical about that over the years. But I, but I, I think I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> it led to uh it led to no, i mean eight albums that's no that's no small undertaking um when when did you make the move from the uh the uh the the wealth filled world of clinical trials in cork to uh to the, the the heady days of filling your shoes with stones in new york when did that happen uh, somewhere between album number three and four <laughs> <laughs> I don't speak. I don't speak years anymore. The pandemic has uh, has robbed me of my ability to do to do uh, traditional time. <laughs> Pre tablet, post tablet. <laughs> yeah, about um, kind of two thousand. It was two thousand and um, seven when I two thousand six two thousand two thousand six. I started moving over to two thousand and seven when I made the uh, made the full move, and I was um, I was uh, uh, awarded the um, the illustrious title. You must have come across this in your in your. Uh, in your time here, I'd lost your title of Alien of Extraordinary Ability. That was my first visa. 
Oh no, I never got anything of extraordinary ability. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I was officially, I was, I, I, I got a great kick out of being recognised as an alien of extraordinary ability. Um, but when I applied, funny story, but when I applied for that visa, um, see, this is the kind of chat that you'd have in a lock-in. Um, I'll, pretend, I'll pretend I'm not also on the internet while I tell this story and try to relax. <laughs> but, um, Dude, don't worry about anyone. But um, in um, yeah, when I applied for my first visa, there was um, there was another Niall Connolly at the time who was um, had been caught in Colombia training. Allegedly training for gorillas. He was one of the Colombia three. And he had the same first right. and last name as me. And he was, uh, at, at the time that I put in my paper, and he was, <laughs> he was wanted by Interpol. So there was a fellow, there was a fellow with the exact same name as me, uh, wanted by Interpol um, uh, as I was applying for, um, for this visa. And it's supposed to take, uh, it's supposed to take 90 days. I think mine took a year and a half. <laughs> part of me was a uh, part of me part, part of me part of me was slightly impressed that they thought i would be so capable <laughs> she's a year and a half that's no joke like waiting to get the word of when you can come over like yeah it's a long time yeah yeah, yeah it's a long, long, you... old, uh, oh. long time but i got it and then i uh i did that for a few times and then um eventually uh once i got married got they went to green card and now i'm a uh, the dual citizenship now, which is lovely. Fair play to you. Fair play to you. I'm 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 about two weeks away, I think, from dual citizenship. All going to plan. Um, we'll see what happens. But I have my I have my citizenship interview in two weeks' Cork, time. Cork, Cork and Ireland, is it? That's it. Cork and Ireland. I have the Cork passport and the Irish passport. I'd be very proud. <laughs> very That's it. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, when you came over to the US, um. Was it a receptive US to you? Was it open? Was it was that were they interested in hearing what you had to say and sing? Um, the, the yes and no. Do you know? Like I, I had, I came from like it was kind of it was uh, it was. Um, it was both incredibly inspiring and very difficult when I came over first, I will say, because I had, I had like, uh, you know, I, ha I had a, I had a bit of a, enough of a career in Europe to pay the bills and to kind of, you know, to feel, feel good <laughs> about it. And then I kind of came from that to like, um, you know, to, to like a lot of the first gigs, there was nobody at, you know, like, and, and um, I remember like, I remember like uh just having taken part of the thing with the visa was which uh, which i'm very grateful for now but at the time that was very difficult was that I, I could only earn money through music i was only allowed to earn money through music and i to do that you'd have to have a following so i didn't to get i i didn't have a following here and i could only earn money through music so at the beginning i was doing a lot of um kind of gigs that i wouldn't do now i remember i was playing in one place in um the, the first summer i was here I booked six Friday nights at this bar in uh, um, in Sunnyside in Queens. And I went in the first night. I was going to play three hours a night from 10 to 1 every Friday night for six weeks. And the first night I went in, there was the bartender and one fella sitting with his back to back to me. <laughs> oh, Jesus. And I, fi I finished my first song. I finished my first song of a three-hour set of a six-week commitment. <laughs> and without taking a break, without, without, take, without even... Without even Without even turning around, your man says, "Take a break." Oh, jeez, that would that would that would affect you, wouldn't it? You thought I long for those clinical trials again? Can I go back to Shandon? Anybody need a bit of blood? Jeez, no, but so it was all it was all it was all. Every gig after that was better. <laughs> well, why don't we? What I did, I did. Like, I, 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 I really. So I would just say on on the plus side, it was I was also playing like some really nice venues in the city that like I, I that were 
that I'd heard of over the years of like lots of my heroes having played on their way up and stuff. And I was, I was just really found it inspiring to like, I would, I would go in and like, like I, when I came out first, I was staying with my aunt who lived in Rockaway as well. And I would, I would, um, like I would go into the city for the day and just, just like, I would walk for 10 hours a day, just, just, just walking around Manhattan, taking it all in. And then, you know, I might do a few songs at an open mic or do a 45 minute set and then go back out to Queens. And it was just like, I was just so energized by the, by the whole thing, you know, it was really like, uh, yeah, I'm really, I'm glad they did. How long ago was that? That was, was that four or five years ago when you made, made the move? No, no, it's 15 years ago now, yeah. 15 years, oh wow, that's a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, 15. Well, we've had, uh, okay, so we've had your, your challenges of uh, a man with his back to you in the bar and uh, the, uh, the, the the sad moving song of James Connolly. Should, should, why don't we take it up a notch at your, uh, <laughs> you give us a suggestion for a, a livelier <laughs> tune. <laughs> okay, okay. This is one from, um, this is a song about friendship. This is one from the al an album called Sound, which of course I don't need to tell uh, Cork men the multiple meanings of sound, but for those of you not not from Cork, um, sound in Cork also can, means like um, li like kind or reliable or trustworthy or understood or yes or, you know, like sound is, you, sound is almost a punctuation in, 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 uh, in Cork. So I had an album in 2013 come out called Sound, and this was the um, the first single from that. This is called Samurai, and this is a song about um, friendship. And I suppose um, um, I bet for anybody who's kind of uh, struggling through the pandemic, it's been I, like it has been a very hard, hard time for many people. And I think a lot of people have um, a lot of people have been like, you know, because they're not, you know obviously there's a lot of the obvious struggles that people are going through and then there's a lot of the more subtle ones where people are just kind of feeling chipped away at the whole time and um and it's uh then you i think on top of that people have feeling well you know nobody in my family has just, you know people are thinking well you know who am i to feel bad because you know i i haven't gotten COVID or nobody in my family has died for COVID. why am i feeling like this and i think i think yeah. it's just like important for us to realize that it is a completely legitimate to feel to not be feeling 100 percent right now like and that, yeah. that that's a, a thing that we will we will move past slowly and it's going to take time to um it's going to take time to 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 recover from and just to be gentle with our our friends but also with ourselves and so that's so i just play this for anybody who's finding it hard at the moment so <laughs> It's not about me. I'm only here for a minute. And I know that I can't fix it. I can help even just a little bit. Won't you let me try? And I promise that I will try not to make it any worse. Steal a little bit of the hurt. If I could be a human shield, if I could be a sign.
work, no work, no work, no matter how we try. If I could be all you make me If I could be a mess, I, 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 cut down your enemy. And I pull it through, alright. If I could be your human shield, if I could be a samurai, I'd cut down your enemies and I'd pull you through all right. That took the that took the pace off. What is up, Peter? I can go now. The child's gone to bed. <laughs> <laughs> there be no there be no dancing on the ceiling. <laughs> well, there will, but it won't be us. <laughs> <laughs> um, some great comments from the audience. Beautiful Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Johnny, loving it. Um, Johnny's out your way as well. Long Island, I think. Uh, Ed in Ohio. Loads of cheers there from Ed. Steve in Colorado giving claps. Chris Connor, you. Steve <laughs> Squire, another fine song. Um, is there a artist that you would identify as being the biggest influence on your kind of for forming your style of music? There are several, to be honest. I, I, it's hard for me to say, um, <coughs> to, I, I, I couldn't give one. But um, I, I suppose I, I really got into music as a teenager. Um, with um, I grew up in uh, in Glanmire, in Meadowbrook, in Glanmire, in County Cork. For those who are uh, not from Cork, it's um, like a suburb of about five miles outside of um, Cork City. And uh, there was, um, I suppose, <laughs> one of the really nice things about where I grew up is that it was um, there was like a I can't, I can't remember. I'm having a, a senior moment. There's about forty houses in the in the estate, you know. So there was loads of um, loads of friends the same age, and we'd all play soccer together and stuff growing up. And um, then when we were about it was about fifteen, it became apparent that I wasn't going to be playing for Manchester United, so I needed another way to um, another way to avoid work. And uh, I foolishly <laughs> thought that mu music would be a, a good option. But uh, myself and my um, myself and my friends, we started a uh, started a band and we we literally um we literally drew drew straws to see who'd play what you know and i uh, i was the bass player for a while in a few grungy punk bands but suffice to say when i was 14 the frank and walters were 17 and they had a number one album and a number one hit in the uk and stuff so we were mad into them growing up and the sultans of ping of course um, <clears throat> and lots of your listeners might american listeners might not know them if you don't i'd say I'm almost kind of jealous, you know, that you have a chance to explore those for the first time. I would say, actually, now I would say that um, the Frank and Walters tune, uh, Tony Cochran, would pair very well with the uh, with that red breast there, you know. <laughs> and maybe, um, maybe the uh, maybe maybe the Sultans of Ping, um, give him a ball in the yard, the grass would pair very well with the with the ten year old. Um, Jesus, yeah, some man. Fair <laughs> you. And you've you've done your homework and, and paired your music with your whiskey. Where... But anyway. So, <laughs> but uh, but back to back to so so back to the, the, the very long answer to a very short question. Uh, I started. I, I was kind of really inspired by those bands locally, and at the same time, of course, um, uh, Nirvana were a big influence on me as a as a teenager. And my sister, my sister, I have two sisters, but my older sister is um, three years. I have two sisters and a brother, I should say. But my my older sister is three years older than older than me, and she had um, so she so, so she had you know, 
three years more of music than me <laughs> at that age was crucial. So she was listening to like um, Bob Dylan and Leonard Cohen and Tom Waits and stuff. And uh, I would hear them kind of through the wall. And uh, I went initially from thinking, is she all right? You know, what's, what's going on with her? <laughs> to, to becoming uh, really, really in, into that kind of stuff too. But especially, especially Leonard Cohen. Especially Leonard Cohen would, be my, would have been my all-time all okay. favourite. So it was kind of a real nice circuitous moment for me to have the chance to um, to have somebody from his band play on my last album. And uh, when I met him, I, I met Have Your Master from Leonard Cohen's band about about six weeks after Leonard Cohen died. And I told him like that I'd seen him, uh, that I'd seen Javier play three times with Leonard Cohen uh, in like um, at Kilmainham Jail in Dublin at the Glaston, Glastonbury and in Brooklyn. And they were, and, and he was like, and he genuinely just asked me, did you like it? And I was just looking, I was like, was, you know, <laughs> probably the three finest musical moments of my life, you know, but. Uh, <clears throat> Such humility. Unbelievable, yeah. Um, How old is your daughter now? She's at uh, two and a half. Two, two and, and a half. half. Yeah. Ha has that changed? Has that changed your musical outlook, your life outlook? What's different about having a two and a half year old running around apart from needing to find weights to keep her tethered to the, the earth? <laughs> um, uh, it's, I suppose it's completely changed my outlook, outlook uh, in many ways. Um, but um I, it's it's hard to know um it's a very good question i like uh, i i i haven't i haven't done a tour since she was born you know like i, I used to do, i used to tour kind of non-stop i haven't done a i haven't done an international tour i should say since since she was born and a part of that is down to the pandemic obviously it's the last kind of year and a bit but um <clears throat> that's um you know I'm, I'm i'm looking forward to i'm both looking forward to and honestly kind of anxious about that because I, I i haven't i haven't been away from her for a length of time and i'm not i'm really not looking forward to that part of, of getting back to uh touring and stuff but um um she's been she's uh it's been it has been a an absolute delight to in one way to sort of be grounded you know at this time for me like to be because like I, my wife's a public school teacher and I, I i'm at home with the my daughter during during the day and and i just to like to be to do that without any like sort of like should i be off to her and should i to do that be, partly because i have to you know because i can't I go anywhere i think I know. It, it really has been a silver lining it has been a silver lining for me to, to have this time with her because you know i'm not going to get time back as, as the cliche goes but um and just yeah, I, yeah. i've really uh i've really appreciated i've really appreciated having the time with her and 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 also having from a selfish point of view having her to occupy to to do to, to, to occupy is the completely is the wrong word but like to, to just sort of uh i just i feel um i feel i feel immense gratitude to be to be a parent is what i'm trying to say i suppose i feel immense gratitude to be a parent and um yeah um and and that that i've been able to have the time with her through this extraordinarily difficult time to, to just yeah. to have like someone something to something to solidly focus on like you know look after this I child know. okay i know, I know. <laughs> yeah yeah you know so you know what i might do very i might do a song and I did. I wrote a couple of songs. Like I, I do, I'm gonna do a song now, which is one of the first ones that I wrote um, for her when she was born, and it was just like a very, very simple song. And it was like, um, um, I just remember like, like very, very. Shall I say she was only about a week or two old? And I, I just remember like just feeling like this sort of, um, just this, just the the wonder at like. Um, just uh, of her being here, and also just like feeling, feeling it, it, it added a color to my gratitude for my towards my own parents, 
and um, right. and grandparents and, and such, you know. So this is just like a very um, this is just a kind of little, a little. Is it too? Is it? Is it safe to do a lullaby for uh, for for people drinking whiskey? Oh, geez, you'll, you'll, I'll be I'll be asleep. If you're, if you're, yeah, if, if I drift off, just just shout louder. <laughs> I just said if you're if you're if you're having a cigarette with your whiskey, maybe put out the cigarette before I sing sing this one. <laughs> Good man. Everything's alright. Everything's just fine. Everything's alright. Everything's just fine. I was thinking about my mother and my father and the fathers and the mothers too as I stood above your crater looking down at you into your eyes so new and blue so new and blue for a moment I swear I saw them lining up looking back at me through Saying everything's all right, everything's just fine, everything's all right, everything's just fine, everything's all right. But in this house, if you want to cry, you can cry anytime you like, it's all right, it's all right. I was thinking about my mother and all the hardship that she knew and my father and all the suffering he went through never gave it to us won't give it to you never gave it to us won't give it to you won't give it to you but you don't have to smile you don't feel like smiling though the sky is blue and the sun is Shining in your heart, you might feel like hiding. Well, that's all right. It's all right. In this house, if you want to cry, you can cry anytime you like. It's all right. It's all right. Everything's all right. Everything's just fine, everything's alright. Everything's just fine. Everything's alright. Everything's alright. So that's a new that's a newish song, Barry. That's not on any that's not on any of the albums yet. Um, if I could do a little segue slash plug, if that's okay, that's I've um at the start of the pandemic I set up a um a Patreon page where you saw that uh, uh where you saw the clinical trial things was actually on the Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash Niall Conley and I've been I've been um I've been doing little teasers of the next album I've been uh, uploading demos of uh, new songs as well as as well as uh, exclusive first access releases of new singles and stuff through the Patreon page, if anyone's curious, it's patreon.com forward Check slash Niall Connolly. And the other other thing I just wanted to mention as well, before while, I, while I'm on the ad break, uh, before I forget, is I do every Saturday and, and Wednesday, um, again, I started this up for the pandemic, I, I decided, like like the soccer players, I just do two days a week, you know? Uh, Wednesday nights at nine. <laughs> uh, I want you to know as well that I, I, I said no right away to the Super League. Um, <laughs> every Wednesday at nine, New York time and every Saturday at every Saturday at three New York time I do a live stream um uh on the Facebook live as well which is just and YouTube which is the Facebook is Niall Conley music and YouTube is just Niall Conley so every Saturday afternoon at three New York time or or eight Cork time and every uh, Wednesday at nine I like that you say Cork time I, I've been calling foolishly calling it Irish time when I should be calling it Cork time I mean what a failure <laughs> <laughs> That's a good a good reminder to, to fix that. Um, before you go on to the next, uh, before we, we move on, I want to move on to the next whiskey. For those who are following along, 
We're moving on now to uh, Tullamore Dew, uh, a 15-year-old blended whiskey. And um, this requires me to play a little intro to a whole new segment that nobody knew existed until tonight. So bear with me while I use my very fancy uh, system here to put on this next segment, which is this. That's it. Blends with friends. How fancy is that? Okay, so we're having a blended whiskey. And um, so we started with a single malt. We moved on to a single pot still, and now we're on to a blended whiskey. This is a, um, as, as Tullamore like to do, uh, they do their blends three ways um, in the sense of three different styles of Irish whiskey blended together, uh, often the case. Um, single pot still, single grain, and single malt are blended together. They call this the trilogy. It's aged for at least 15 years, um, but it's aged in three different casks. So it starts off by being aged in bourbon casks, then it's uh, moved to sherry casks, and then it finishes its journey, its sleep in a rum cask and this is a very different whiskey i had never had this until uh, earlier this week i decided to pick it up i wanted three big names three familiar names three old school names were well used in the world of irish whiskey and i thought bush mills red breast and tullamore would fit that bill but you don't hear much about uh tullamore dew 15 year old and growing up in ireland you didn't hear much about it at all most of it was sent for export uh, and the focus in Ireland was on powers. As a, uh, so there was a, a plan early on in the formation of Irish distillers back in 1966 that uh, domestically the emphasis would be put on powers and then internationally Tullamore Dew would be focused on. And that remained the case for many, many years. And eventually Irish distillers sold Tullamore Dew to, to, to William Grant, uh, who are now obviously putting a lot of money into it. And they built a new distillery. Uh, but what we have here is a one of the first ever Irish whiskies that was finished or aged in a rum cask um, in our generation anyway, going back a hundred years was very common use rum casks to fill our, or to, to mature our whiskey, but um, something very different. So I know a few of you are following along um, with the Tullamore Dew 15 year old. So I'd be curious to get your thoughts on it. I'll give you a little of what I'm getting on the nose of it. So it's quite uh, sweet. There's an obvious uh, sweetness, but not the kind of a red breast sweetness on this one, more of a, it, it clearly is a rum contribution. There's a very heavy contribution from the rum. It's not uh, unsavory, but it's quite overpowering. So if you do like a rum finish, you do like a rum contribution, you like that kind of a refined sweetness, almost like sugarcane sweetness. It's very there, very present on the nose. We'll take a little sip. Again, that sweetness right out of the gate uh, welcomes you on the palate and you get sherry notes, you get vanilla, you get nut, kind of nutmeg coming through, but it's quite dry. It's almost like there should be more of a sweetness. It's like a hint at sweetness, but it's not quite a full throaty, sweet drop on your throat. Uh, uh, it's almost like it needs a little bit more sweetness. So it's quite a dry finish, but it goes on and on and on in that dry finish for quite a while. This one's gonna take a little bit of time for me to get to understand it and get to know it because I'm not at all familiar with Tullamore Dew 15 year old first time trying it. So interesting to get interested to get uh, your thoughts on it. Um, let me see who's got some there, Steve. Da, 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 da. Let me have a look at the comments. We need some music for our segments. We do. We need to, we need to up our game with these little interstitials. Um, I need to hire a, a video crew who will work for whiskey and they'll make something for me. Um, Peter says his TD, his Tullamore Trilogy is half full. Tony has got Tully 14, couldn't find the 15. It's an interesting one. It doesn't have the sweetness of red breast uh, and it doesn't have the floral, light, delicate notes of the of the Bushmills. It's a very different whiskey, a blend, the only blend we're drinking tonight. Um, the malt comes through at the end, biscuity, crumbly at the end. A little bit of sweetness in the front, but not enough for me. I like a little bit more sweet. Anyway, I'll keep sipping it anyway because I'm a trooper. Right. Um, do do. I'll do it. I will. I will. I'll do it. Now, while we were talking, while you were singing, uh, we have so we have a big Irish whiskey community that's grown up around this lock-in and around our um, uh, around stories and sips. And we have a Facebook group called Irish Whiskey Fans of America. We have lots of great friends that we've made there and people we've met in person because of it. And we got the sad news there um, just a few minutes ago that one of our group members, uh, his father, passed away. So we're going to raise a glass um, to Tyler's dad and say, you know, Slauncha and um, and, and hope you have um, uh, some comfort in these tough times and um, that you're re uh, comforted by the memories uh, and, and what an awful call that you, you must have received today and, and to Nicholas's, Nicholas, your, your, your son. Um, we're thinking of you and um, maybe we'll dedicate the next song 
uh, to Tyler's dad uh, as, we're, as, we're, as we're singing and thinking about them and uh, tough times. So um, hope you find some peace. Sorry, sorry for your last Tyler. Um, um, yeah, uh, I suppose I, I read this lovely thing once just about um, about grieving that uh, people are with us for as long as as long as their names are mentioned, you know, and uh, may the memory of your father uh, just uh, give you some comfort and um, I'll sing this one for you now. The sun is on your back, spring is in your step, and your fears have come and left. When you find your peace at last, and your troubles are all past, and your friends are all Find me close to you. When the rain is in your eyes, when worries have your Worried mind when peace is hard to find. When your dreams are all laughed and your hopes are all turning out bad and your friends are not so true. Find me close to you. Lovely choice there, Nile. Lovely tune. Thank you. Lovely tune. All right, R.I.P. R.I.P. Indeed. Um, R.I.P. And maybe may we be left with the memories. Um, as we continue on our lock-in, um, I'm curious uh, to know how life is going to be different. Do you think for you and your music and how you played now that? we've experienced a pandemic and processes and systems and approaches to things have changed. Does it change much for you once things open back up in New York? I suppose the only, the only honest answer to that is, is I don't know, do you know? Um, um, I mean, I, 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 I don't know what it, how much it changes. Um, I have, or, or like it, it, it's, it definitely it definitely changes, but I don't know exactly how much and in what way as things reopen. Um, um, I feel I, I feel I'm, I'm very glad that I like at the beginning I decided to do as I, as I mentioned I decided to do the the live stream twice a week, and I'm glad that I did it because now as things are reopening I feel I feel 
ready do you know i feel like i've been working do you know whereas i i've talked to some other musician friends who are like god i forget the words to all my yeah, songs yeah. and things like that because they just we you know it's completely unnatural for us not to be you know pe- many of us are out four or five nights a week generally like so for people to just have a a pause of several months is like you they'll get it back and they'll have it back you know after after a few gigs definitely but it's but it's that there's like a as i know a certain musician friends i've been talking to have this like this uh going back to school after the summer holidays anxiety you know <laughs> which, which which i like am i going to remember how to do trigonometry no i'm not going to remember how to do trigonometry but i have, i do remember how to play guitar and sing so uh, <laughs> i'm not like I, I'm, I'm glad that i that i'm glad that i managed that i kept going to, with the digital stuff and the virtual stuff for during the pandemic and um, I'm extremely extremely grateful for the support I've got uh, for the live streams and through the patreon page while I wasn't able to work really you know and um, it would yeah. be nice like it, one, of, one of the things that I might carry forward I suppose after the pandemic is like it's been really nice to especially the Saturday afternoon stream because I, I did it I p- picked afternoon so it would be the evening in Europe you know and like it's been really nice to be able to um, stay in touch with fans in Ireland and the UK and Germany and Italy or whatever and I might I might keep that going on a Saturday afternoon because I'm typically not playing of an afternoon anyway and it's a nice way to um to stay in touch with people that I've met all over the world um that's nice yeah you know through through decades of touring and um and, and, and I definitely I can say absolutely certainly I never ever would have done a live stream if I if it hadn't been for the pandemic so I am that's that's another thing that I will carry forward um i i'm kind of beginning beginning the re-entry if we call it that i did a i did a lovely outdoor gig in um, in woodstock at a, there's a great spot in woodstock the colony in woodstock in new york and they have um i've been doing a lot of work with them over the year well, for several years and um but uh they they have a lovely kind of uh they set up a an outdoor stage it's like a mini festival really out the back there they have a beautiful beer garden and stuff so that was I did that last week and I did a couple of them over the summer and they were kind of really nice, very relaxed ways to re-enter because, well, first of all, you're, you're, you're 20 feet away from anybody and I'm, you know, and they, they had done a really nice, um, they were doing it really safely. So my plan, I think, really is to do, um, is to, just to do a few few more, um, few more outdoor ones. Uh, um, I'm due to get the second shot of the vaccine uh, on the 8th of May. 8th of May. So like after after that period, I think I think I will, you know, largely do outdoor stuff while the weather is good, and then hopefully, hopefully, you know, who knows? But hopefully, if things continue to improve, maybe by autumn uh, we could be looking to, uh, you know, doing the likes of uh, Stella and Fly and the Rockwood Music Hall and the, the oh, very outdoor good. stuff again. Hopefully, but uh, you know, I, I'm not I'm not taking taking it for granted. I would love to. Um, I'd love to. I'd love to be maybe. I'm thinking about maybe doing, you know, maybe maybe I'll be able to do like a European tour in the spring of next year or something again, or like a nationwide tour here. Like, but one step at a time. I'm doing the light, the outdoor stuff now, which is, which is a great kind of a kind of a stepping stone back to it. When we were um, chatting before we came on, we talked about how uh, your brother was telling you. Uh, that he had heard about you coming on the show because he works with my sister and my sister was telling me that she had heard about you coming on the show because she <laughs> talked to your brother and we talked about how what a terrible travesty it is that two cork fellas can't talk in america without people in cork talking about them talking um when was the last time you you got to see uh, the, fa- <laughs> the family back home <laughs> sorry I, I i was too busy laughing to hear the actual <laughs> When was the last time you saw them in, in, in Cork or when was the last time that, um, yeah, that you saw any of the family oh, in person? Was, yeah, it was, it's, it was, yeah, it's, it's, it's um, August of, uh, 2019. So it's the longest, the longest I've ever gone. Probably the same for yourself. I'm sure the longest I've ever gone without getting home. And I, I, I am finding it very, um, that for that's the hardest thing for me because I'd like especially with having it you know I, I suppose more so with having a, a small child just like um yeah I'd be very eager for my parents to actually get to uh, get to see her, see her again in in person but uh, hopefully you know um 
they've got the first start of their vaccines. I've got, you know, things are moving in the right direction, hopefully, and uh, we'll get um fingers crossed. We'll get there, you know. But but uh, yeah, that, so it's been it's it's been it has been the longest ever that I haven't been home, and um, yeah. Um, I have a song for that, actually, if you'd like to hear oh, it. Fair, oh, good segue. Yeah, fair play to you. Look at that. Teed up for you. Um, this one is... Um, yeah, this is... Uh, one of the singles I released there just at the end of last year. Um, if I could just mention as well that... Uh, that some of your listeners may not know about it. I know you. My music is available. It's available everywhere, wherever you, wherever you get music on, you know, Spotify or Apple, Apple Music or whatever. Any of the streaming services is available. But the the one that is, uh, the one that is best, the best. If you're buying music, the best place to buy it for independent musicians is through a service called Bandcamp. So um, if anyone's interested in buying music, they can get it through uh, through Bandcamp, and not just not just my music, but if you're buying independent music as downloads or anything um bandcamp gives a far it's the uh it's the uh, i suppose the uh, almost the, uh, the the fair trade version for musicians they, they, uh, <laughs> that they must be musicians because they because because i don't know how i don't know how it works as a business plan for them <laughs> <laughs> anyway this is called um this is called maybe next year and it's a very self-explanatory song um just sort of uh, I, I wrote it during the summer when i was feeling uh feeling quite homesick I suppose and um, it's just about uh, looking forward to getting back home and I suppose lots of us can relate to that where, wherever home may be and I will say um, one other thing if you don't if you don't like this song um, don't worry it's very short <laughs> come on make it through beautiful beautiful thank you Barry Chris Connor wants to know if you're going to come with us on the stories and sips road trip back to Ireland when we hit every distillery and pub in the country uh, yes 
<laughs> I'll drive the bus. <laughs> Good man. We need a bus driver. Lots of cheers and claps. <laughs> Melinda, Scott, Johnny, John, Thanks, Chris, Janique, Maureen. They're coming through quick and fast. Fair play to you all. Um, the, the well, great supporters here for us. Take a screenshot of this. This is this is good. Oh, geez, this this will be on your reel. You'll be sending this, this around to this the, uh, the studios. <laughs> <laughs> this is almost making up for your man at the bar telling me to take a break after the first song. <laughs> almost, almost. <laughs> Dermot, a great uh, a Tipperary oh, man. Oh, no, who, he misses home up there in New Jersey. Uh, Dermot, we we all miss home, and uh, hopefully we all get back there soon. Um, yeah, very good. Um, drain the country dry of tears, no doubt, or whiskey. I don't know which. <laughs> it's hard to know. Um, you're over in America now as long as I am, or maybe a little bit longer. I came over in 2006, 2007, and um, there's a bit of Ireland, of course, that never leaves you, and a bit of Cork that never leaves you. Would there be things you'd be you'd be pining for that you wish you had more access to, apart from people or family? Are there things you miss about Cork and Ireland? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, uh, well, family would be the, the first one, obviously. Um, um, I miss them. Um, do you know? Do you know? A, a, a thing that I don't you don't see as much here is like there's like the oh, i don't at least like i hope it may have changed in the last 15 years at home too but like just the like the um the last minute arrangement thing you know you could like you say like you could you could like an evening could take a bend do you know like you could, <laughs> you could be out for a walk and you could bump into somebody and you could go in and have a coffee with coffee with them and or a pint or whatever like in several hours that were not planned could be filled in a very uh <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a very sociable way do you, do you, do you know like, i feel i feel yeah, like that yeah i feel like that it takes more everything takes more organizing here do you know do, i don't know if it's, yeah I don't yeah it's just the geography of the of the place i want like of it, but like like i just feel like there's more there was more like that that um uh, the serendipity, I mean? like yeah, the, the like serendipity the, the, of it like, in Ireland, like yeah, 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 yeah. There's just more space for it, maybe. And I that know. could have changed in the last while. It could have, it could have been the age that I was when I was there. Those could be factors of it too, you know. I could be like turning old, trying to go home, you know. There's something that isn't there anymore, but it's like, uh, but right, but, but yeah. I, I feel yeah. like that sense of like that that. The sense of um, and that that is also something that that kind of tangentially links to something. The thing like the thing I miss, one of the things I miss most about the pandemic, is like the randomness of like, uh, do you know, everything is so like, like, do you know, I'd be like, even even just like f commuting to and f to to gigs and stuff, and like overhearing something on a subway or like seeing something mad in the city or going out, you know, or just like having having like uh you know going going to do a gig and having a catching up with somebody beforehand or afterwards or meeting meeting new people that kind yeah, of yeah like, yeah just the kind of random element of the day i know i know that our whole existence is kind of like got a lot of random in it because we don't know how the, in the bigger picture we don't know what's going to happen but like the day-to-day -day kind of like like the day-to-day -day excitement of random moments in a city or or, or in life have just been like yeah um, pause in a sense i miss that like the, i miss the like uh the hint of madness like at the edges of an evening or, or like or i know on, on i know the, you know we've talked about that a lot over the past few weeks <laughs> yeah yeah no i know what you mean yeah there's been lots of talk about just the, the <laughs> desire for a, a messy session where we don't know where we'll end up and who we'll meet and and we'll be looking through our credit card receipts the next day to see where we went and and wouldn't we be thankful for it you know because it would indicate <laughs> a good night out you know something was achieved something was accomplished yeah yeah but e e e even like yeah or even just like just yeah definitely yeah but but also just just, just even like just like you know just i suppose yeah that the element of the 
of of, of something outside. I suppose I would really appreciate the the element of unexpected in in the in the in the per, peripheral vision of my day. Do you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know what you mean. A bit of excitement. Um, well, one of the the questions came in there from our yeah. audience. Uh, Steve, uh, he's asking it kind of both of us really, but we'll put it to you first because uh, uh, that's that's my privilege as as the host. I get to put things to you and put you on the spot and uh, make you uh, squirm first. But he asks, uh, why have we decided to stay here in the US instead of going back home? Are you going first to me? Yeah, it's on, it's on you uh, first. My, yeah, my um, I I. I Okay, I I, 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 um, I met and married a beautiful American lady, and uh, I, that's the shortest answer. <laughs> <laughs> Would she like to go to Ireland at all? And, and patient. <laughs> to move? Yeah. I mean, we, we yeah, um, not, not, at the mo- not at the moment, uh, but, you know, not, not, it's not something we're thinking about right, right now, but uh, I wouldn't rule it out ever, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Um, Janique says, love is always the reason. Um, a similar answer, I met a, a beautiful uh, American woman here uh, who I married, and um, but saying that, that doesn't mean we will live here forever, and I think we'd, we'd like to travel and, and do lots of interesting things if we can, if we're lucky enough uh, to have the opportunity to do it. We'll, we'll move around a bit uh, over the coming years. Uh, so uh, it's not that one place has to be the place forever, and I, I don't know about you, but... The pandemic, if, if it's taught me anything, is that place is is a place is just a construct, you know, in the sense of we don't have to be in one place to do a thing. You could be in multiple places or many places and travel around and perhaps yeah. apply a trade and make a living and meet interesting people. So I think that perspective maybe has become more pronounced now over the past few months. So, yeah, anything could happen yet. Who knows? I like that love is always the reason uh, comment. It is. It's always involved. If it's, it's always not, involved. ask yourself why you're doing it. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Um, yeah, and I, I think... Uh, if, I know, if, I think if, we were, if we were asking, if we were, if we were asking David, if, if, if you were asking the previous guest to answer that question, no, he'd still be, he'd still be evading it. He was very he, good at we, it. He was very good at it. He was fantastic. Mil- I, I'm only, oh, he was. I'm only... Uh, I'm only uh, <laughs> I'm only having fun here. He was fantastic, but he was very good. He, I, I, he was a master class in, in giving, a, giving a bit of an answer. <laughs> what is the, the, mili- the military training inside him? Yeah, we got nothing out of him. Nothing. Nothing at all. Um, we, uh, we, we know less now than we did when he, when he joined. No, we learned some things, but uh, no, there's more we need. <laughs> there's more we need. <laughs> he's just, he's just he, he was leaving a cliffhanger, so we'd have him back again. I suppose when you're in charge of missiles, you'd you'd have to be careful with secrets. You'd have to be careful with knowledge. If if missiles were your business, you know. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder has anyone ever? I wonder has anyone ever began began a sentence before by saying, "I suppose when you're in charge of missiles." I don't want the word suppose. I don't want the word suppose and missiles. I, I want any, any, anything anything involving. Missiles to be a lot more uh, definitive. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I liked his line of uh, "If it wasn't for my wife, I'd still be working in missiles." You know, I thought, well, there's there's a good one. We've not heard a, a line like that I before. Know, I know. I, 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 I actually wrote that down. He might be in the song. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Work it into a song. We'd be very impressed. <laughs> It'd be a hit. Ba boom. Ah, here we go. Here we go. Ah, you got up early. You got up early. Have you any? Have you any tunes that were inspired by Cork? That were uh, that. And I, I know I'm harping on about Cork, but isn't it a wonderful thing when two Cork men on the other side of the world can have a chat? Yeah, many. I've many. Um, let me see which one. Um, you know what? I do this one because I, I I do have to kind of keep it kind of mellow because it's uh i'm in the apartment and there's neighbors to consider so i do i'll um uh i'll do this one this is one from an album that, that was released in 2007 uh it's called the album's called the future tense and um i've, I've so many songs that were inspired by cork i give you a list 
but this one is called Jim makes me want to be clean and it takes but it's it's like um there's lots of cork in it you, you can see how many cork references you get yourself great <laughs> Also, maybe it's a good one for your your comment about um, waking up the next morning, going through the receipts. <laughs> <laughs> Come drink with us, oh no, you see my good side, yeah, good side. We'll hang out with the poet and the boy, we'll have some good times, yeah, good times. But she makes me wanna be clean Show my bright side always From my bright side to be real You know it's not so far From the city to the sea We could wake up in the morning Take the salt from the breeze as the rays from the lighthouse reel my ship in Well, I know I won't sink if this girl will swim up But she makes me wanna be clean Show my bright side always From my bright side to be real Now the future's looking brighter I'm not afraid of anything my head is clear, my time is mine, I got nothing to lose and nothing to hide. But I like you and I don't know why. I like you and I don't know why. I didn't ask you then, I haven't asked you yet. I couldn't find the right time. early morning empty streets and we'll hang out by the bridge in the upside down city and listen to the dawn chorus by the lee we're looking good in watercolors you and me oh, but she makes me wanna be clean show my bright side always from my bright side she makes me wanna be clean show my bright side always for my bright side to be real Now the future's looking brighter I'm not afraid of anything My head is clear My time is mine I got nothing to lose And nothing to hide And I like you And I don't know why I like you, and I don't know why. I didn't ask you then, and I haven't asked you yet. There'll never be a better time. got the rain we even have the rain tapping on my window there for uh, the special uh, special effects it's great timing great timing very impressed <laughs> well done jeez that's beautiful beautiful pay extra for that <laughs> <laughs> send me send me the bill we'll get you squared away chris loved it maureen loved it <laughs> Ma um beautiful yeah oh thank you um these are the kind of songs where we should be sipping on a whiskey like you have to be sipping on the whiskey for these, like, just uh, letting the mood take us, you know. If if after if after the session you want to hear, there's another one, another couple that are very cork. Are um, there's one. Um, I just I might do one more for you if, if that's all right. Would that be every time? Cheers, we do a course. Yeah, this is a very and cork. I, I and this is from my first album. Okay, go this ahead. Is take from it away. My first album. This is called um, Old, Old Post Office Lane. 
And um, the old post office lane, I just remember, used to run down the side of Sir Henry's in uh, Cork. And, um, and this is a song, really, I suppose, um, this is kind of a song, I suppose, a song about depression, depression really, and um, about kind of trying to look out for each other. And um, there's a lovely, I was playing this at a stream the other day, and someone brought up a lovely memory of um, of singing. There was a bit at the end of it where people at the live gigs often kind of come in and sing it with me. And it's a, I can't wait to do it in a room with people again. But um, um, this, yeah, so this one is like just off um, South Main Street. Another song that is pure cork, if you want to check out, is the Four Face Liar. From, <laughs> and I've won them. Um, don't I've loads and half half of them are set in cork. <laughs> Somebody says you're unwell You wanna be on your own And I'm worried it's coming back And I know it happens all the time But surely not to friends of mine Down the old post office lane, the stench of piss and the rain in your face onto the grand parade at 3 a.m. Feel the footpath crack beneath your feet. Look out for your mother, God knows. God knows she's watched your back. First sign of trouble, oh please. Please, oh please, please don't answer back I know it happens all the time But surely not to friends of mine Well, we're all on the same side tonight This is your bit we're all on the same side tonight. We're all on the same side tonight. We're all on the same side tonight. A good mantra for life there we're all on the same side we're all on the same side don't we all want just a bit of happiness Absolutely. a bit of peace mm -hmm. a bit of enjoyment a bit of love that's it that's it beautiful beautiful um give small, please give nyla a small bit of whiskey a small bit of whiskey indeed or a lot of whiskey um three whiskeys perhaps uh give nyla a round of applause please um maureen out quick out of the gate um mark says uh you really need to be listening to these songs in a dark pub with a fire going drinking whiskey um yep you absolutely do and as soon as the time is right isn't that where we'll be isn't that where we'll be beautiful music for a windy night in brooklyn from gochen good man gochen johnny mcnally giving a few a few cheers and chris loving it and scott loving it chris wants volumes of whiskey in reference to a, a previous joke and a previous lock-in um <laughs> there is what we i remember going to see a few times in new york nile um you mentioned Stella and Fly, and there was uh, another venue, I can't remember the name of it, where we, we, we took about 84 subways, uh, 84 uh, stops on the subway, and we got to a venue, and you did a wonderful rendition of this beautiful song that became my wife's favorite song, and that was um, um, one of your well-known songs, Places I Promise I Go, and she loves that song so much. I wonder, would you, would you be willing to give us an old rendition of that for Melinda tonight? <laughs> no, <look>. <laughs> <laughs> I will, of course. I will, of course. <laughs> I, was, I just wanted to feel what it would like to be a mean person there. <laughs> that was awful. That was heart wrenching, actually. <laughs> Sorry. But absolutely, Melinda. I'll do. I'll do it. Um, I'll do it now. Um, this is. Um, 
thank you for uh, I'm glad you like the song. This is a this is a story of a, a criminally underrated uh, folk singer. I don't know where I got the inspiration. Um, <laughs> thank you, John. John says John John there says I'm downloading albums as I listen. Um, no. Yeah, I, 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 I predict great fortune in your immediate future, John. <laughs> <laughs> can I also just, just can I can I shamelessly just give one more mention that, that they do the Saturday afternoon stream at three o'clock in New York time if anyone is uh, uh, free any Saturday, stop by and say hello. Uh, so this is from Linda. This is place I promised I'd go. Uh, um, I, I've often introduced this this one like this, but this is this is this is still true. Um I was touring years ago. The best advice I ever got uh, on tour. Um, I was touring years ago, and um, we were in uh, Vienna, and we 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 were we'd been in, on tour for about a month at this point, and we were like uh, ready to kill each other, and we were bedraggled. Uh, it would be put it politely. I met this. Uh, the gigs the gigs were going great. We were just like too cheap to look after ourselves properly and um, uh, <laughs> worn out, and. Um, <clears throat> I met this older, uh, older musician, and he uh, he took me aside and he said, "There's um, I have some advice if you'd like to hear." And I said, "Absolutely, hit me." And he said, "The first piece of advice is that um, when you're on tour the band, you don't have to do everything together, you know, because you kind of forget, like you've been in the van, sitting, you know, elbows into each other for five hours, and then you go to the same." restaurant and the same you know the same you could you you know it would be good for mental health to take a uh, half an hour apart from each other and remember why you love each other so that was good advice but the best piece of advice that he ever that anyone ever gave me regarding music was he said um he said when you're on tour every time you see a vegetable Eat it. In the van and out, I'm already feeling sick. Should a little more sleep or a little less to drink. Five hours later, Johnny, I really need a break. We're pulling so I gotta tackle these shakes. What a cold cup of coffee or a warm can of beer. It's tough at the top, it ain't easy down here, and it's hot figure out a way to keep moving without losing what you love at home and my time is measured out between places I've been and places I promised I'd go I'm arguing with strangers smoking I don't smoke Drinking till they throw us out, some places won't throw. Me and Barry, we got no sense, it's go, go, go. I'll pay for this tomorrow and struggle through the show. It's hard to figure out a way to keep moving without losing what you love at home. And my time is measured out. Between places I've been and places I promised I'd go. Just in finally quiet, I must be playing with that phone. The national is singing on the radio. Something dark, something sad, pretty and slow. Something about someone out in Ohio. I feel every drop of blood, every sinew, every bone. Hey, gather you awake, man. I'm afraid to go home, and it's hard to figure out. Way to keep moving without losing what you love at home. And my time is measured out. But 
Between places I've been and places I promised I'd go. Yes, it's hard to figure out a way to keep moving without losing what you love at home. And my time is measured out between places I've been and places I promised I'd go. I'm trying Here. to think. I'm trying to think where you would have seen me that you would have had to take 87 stops, unless you like forgot to get off the train and we're going up and down. Was Melinda, where was that? We got the um, where we saw Nile. What was the place we went to? What was the place we went to um, by the the bookshop? Do you remember the bookshop we went into first when we went to see uh, Niall at a bar in New York, and we stopped off at a bookshop? I can't remember. Oh, oh. Where? What part of the New York was that? It was near Stell and Fly. Near Stell and Fly? It was, yeah. It looked like a No, it wasn't near and Fly, a different place. Stell and Fly was the bar up in, was that the Upper East Side, is it? Lower East Side. We can't remember. Stell and Fly, uh, anyway, anyway, we can have yeah. this conversation amongst ourselves. <laughs> Stell and Fly is actually a, a car. Stell and Fly is the Upper East Side, it's a, a cork uh, run business. Um, uh, and there, I'll be hopefully be back there. There were I was already on. There, they were one of the first people I called about possibly uh, doing more stuff in the in the um, in the autumn doing the thing there. I I I started a collective when I when I came out first. I started this. Um, I started doing this uh, thing Wednesday night sound club, and um, we yeah. actually kind of became a collective big city folk, and we put on a lot of. Um, songwriter nights and a, a, a mini festival every second year and stuff but i do uh in the before times and hopefully again starting in the uh, in autumn i do a night at stella and fly yeah called the big city folk song club which is um which uh is basically a, a like a it's like a curated open mic everybody who comes is very very good and um so it's really a lovely community so i look forward to getting back to that um whenever the time is right mm. We'll have to uh, we'll have to have an audience uh, meet in New York at the right time uh, for a few drinks and uh, join you for a few tunes. Yeah. It'll be a great night. Um, I do I do like uh, I have toured fairly extensively in the US as well. So if your listeners are um, liking what they hear, they can sign up on the mailing list on the um, on the website as well. I, I I do not bombard you with with stuff, and uh, hopefully I'll be back to touring at some time in the next uh, year or so too. Well, you've a, you've a, a, a welcoming audience here who, who've enjoyed the tunes tonight. I know some have downloaded the albums and have signed up for the list here. I'm seeing it in the comments. So That's hopefully uh, ho hopefully we can all meet together and have a drink at some point, um, be it in New York or Cork or somewhere or Ohio or who knows where. But anywhere would help at this stage, wouldn't it? Um, so hopefully we, can, hopefully we can do that soon. All of them. All of them. Yeah, all of them. <laughs> all of the above. All of the above. Um, well, your, your brother and my sister now can be reassured that we had a good old chat and uh, when they when their chins wag. So my sister works with Niall's brother <laughs> and um, and they'll be uh, comparing notes. And my sister said, she's not staying up this late. I don't care who's playing. I'll watch it, I'll watch it tomorrow on the replay, she said. <laughs> Very good, yeah, yeah. Um, will I do one to cl close it out? For Brilliant, I'd love time. that. Is that all right? Brilliant, yeah. Thanks a million. I'd love that. That'd be great. All right. Thank you so much. Um, um, thank you. And thank you all. Thanks to all your uh, listeners for the kind comments and for tuning in. I'll see you. See you down the road. This is a song about some of the jobs I had that I hope <laughs> to never have again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but no, all, jo all jokes aside, it's about it's a it's a, a song of um, gratitude to everybody uh, um, who was. Uh, had helped make it possible for me to have a um a life in music and a, a sincere thank you to you barry for uh, uh reaching out and um inviting me to be on this i i, I was delighted to hear from you and uh, i've uh, thoroughly enjoyed it so thank you i fixed on
So the grass might grow green In richer men's homes I answer for I was polite to idiots For thirteen hour shifts I swept floors I know every kind of cardboard box I'd have built them, stacked them, folded them up I packed tulips, I picked grapes I learned lessons, I, I made mistakes, yeah I made loans Believe me when I tell you, believe me when I say it's really good to have you here today. I bought a guitar from my friend's cousin When I had nothing I found something Never hungry, never thirsty No, I never slept outside All right then, maybe once or twice Don't tell my mother not consecutive nights No, I've always been looked after I've always been just fine I played street corners Subway stations, festivals and embassies, for film stars and the constellations, the down and out, the in between. Oh, believe me when I tell you, believe me when I say it's really good to have you here today. Well, I know that you are tired, it's been a tough week, you've been tested, could have stayed at home tonight, with a six pack and Netflix, still you pull yourself together, yeah, you make the noble effort, tall bridges, babysitters, it all adds up. It's expensive, oh, believe me, when I tell you, believe me, when I say, I wouldn't be here without you today. Margaret. <laughs> Girl, Margaret, nice. Girl, Margaret. Fantastic. Great old, great old session, a great night, and um, you've entertained us, and you've uh, you've educated us at the same time, and you've kept us uh, connected <laughs> to Ireland, connected to Ireland, and to and to each other through your songs. So thanks for that. Uh, it's a privilege to listen to you, and uh, and we're we're just very appreciative of your of your time and your talents. Seriously, it means a lot to us. Yeah. Like, likewise. Thanks for thinking. Thanks. Thank you for thinking of me, Barry. And I'll, I'll see you uh, somewhere between here. Somewhere between. Uh, Cork in San Diego. Sounds good. Now we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully we'll, 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 we'll have you back again. Hopefully you'll come back and join us again and uh, give us some more tunes and we'll hopefully see you in person. And uh, yeah, Absolutely. we'll see you down the road. All right. So it's tonight. Thanks a million for joining us. Slaunch Cheers, everybody. buddy. Good night. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Aren't we very lucky? Aren't we very lucky? Melinda said it best. Thanks, Niall. Brilliant. Uh, and she only around the corner from me here. Um, Tammy says, thanks for sharing your gift with us. It is a gift, isn't it? Uh, and how lucky are we that we get to be in the presence of great singers and songwriters and thinkers. And one of the, I, I love, I love a, a thoughtful thinker, somebody who will take the time to pen a tune and pen a song and write their thoughts down and share them with us and find some way to communicate their feelings and their thoughts and their, their emotions and their mood and what's working and what's not working and their, their highs and their lows with us. And, you get that through singer-songwriters, don't you? And Niall struck a chord with us from the moment we first heard him. And uh, Melinda's been a big fan, and I've been a big fan ever since. And we're just very lucky uh, that we had him here tonight. And uh, good Cork man. And uh, we'll, we'll bring Niall back again uh, to, to, to join us for some tunes. And then we'll see him in person, hopefully. 
what whiskey is next says johnny well listen we've gone through three whiskeys uh, we started with the bushmills 10 year old it's been years since i've had the bushmills 10 year old i'll be quite honest i have not had this on my shelf i have not owned a bottle of this in three years four years maybe uh, and i've been reminded how amazing it is an amazing 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 whiskey and what value 44 dollars for a 10 year old single malt from maybe the greatest single malt maker in ireland bush mills um that's what we started with tonight i might go back to that for a fourth a fourth owl nip and a wee nip of that uh we moved on to red breast 12 year old next no stranger to any of you red breast 12 year old maybe the most popular whiskey in our group for good reason if you don't drink it neat throw it into old fashions put a drop of ice into it if you have to but uh whatever you do get it into you it's a, a, a an incredible whiskey the most awarded single pot still whiskey in the world there is no single pot still whiskey that's more awarded than that and then finally we moved on to the tullamore dew 15 year old uh i tasted this neat to begin with straight out of the bottle which i did earlier in the day as well uh during a taste test uh didn't connect with it immediately didn't connect with it the second time steve uh smathers had some good advice good suggestion which was leave it a little bit let it open up well i went one step further and i added a couple of drops of water to it and let it sit there and it did evolve the uh, whiskey i've um i've not had a great success rate with rum finishes or rum matured whiskies i like a rum drink i like a mojito i like rum cocktails uh, but not i've never seen rum and whiskey perfectly married together i know teeling have done some uh, good finishes and maturations in rum obviously Tullamore do as well between their 15 year old and their caribbean rum cask uh, it does change and evolve and it does become to me sweeter and maybe look it gets that sweetness or it, it arrives at the sweetness that i was hoping to get after it evolves and opens up a little bit with a drop of water um would it be my regular daily drinker no because i'm still struggling to connect even though i love sugar i love sweetness i couldn't connect fully perhaps with the uh with the rum on the 15 year old but i but here's my promise to that whiskey i'll go back to it so that i can try again because uh it could be the moment it could be the confluence of all other whiskies and foods that i eat or drink on a day uh, during the day that might affect my my taste buds so we'll try that one again we'll try that one again steve wants to know uh what is the black bush old-fashioned recipe uh the black bush old-fashioned recipe that i've been making and to the best of my knowledge is the same one that lauren shared is uh this gets very scientific a decent measure of bush mills a decent measure of black bush uh, decent as we'd say in cork decent measure two fingers of black bush um but first what i put into my i, I well i take my rocks glass if i haven't simple syrup made which would be uh, a mixture uh, of 50 percent turbinado sugar 50 percent water boiled cooled keeps for a few days in the fridge maybe up to a week um that'll be my simple syrup if i don't have simple syrup teaspoon of sugar white sugar refined sugar turbinado sugar whatever sugar you have um or that you're uh, interested in in having in your cocktail uh three to four dashes of angostura bitters maybe a dash of orange bitters in there as well if you're feeling very fancy pour my whiskey in on top of that maybe a, little t a small little dash of water just a drop a little drop of water uh to connect the sugar um if, if it's if it's raw sugar not the sugar syrup just add a little bit of liquid uh, to connect the um the bitters and the sugar together then i'll add my whiskey in i'll stir those together uh, I'll try and dissolve those as best as I can. Dissolve the sugar if it's if it's raw cane sugar or, or or granulated sugar. If it's sugar syrup, we won't have any of those problems. It'll already be dissolved. And then uh, once that's uh, as dissolved as it can be, I'll add my large ice cube, a square, big big chunky square ice cube, and then I will use my stirring spoon to uh, chill my cocktail until I can feel the cool chill of the ice on the outside of the glass. And then all I'll put in is the uh, the rind of an orange simple as that a little squeeze the the peel of the orange uh, over the uh cocktail to give me some of the oils from the orange peel from the orange skin just give me some of those uh those lovely clear and and very heavy oils and they'll give a lovely a lovely um flavor to my cocktail and that's it that's my black bush uh, old-fashioned and it's between black bush and red breast 12 that's how i make my old fashions uh orange peel uh steve uh, no cocktail cherry for me i can't stand cherry don't like cherry at all no not for me um to me a classic old-fashioned is just the orange peel now some people say lemon some people say orange peel and uh, then others will add fruit 
like cherries, etc. I've had all variations. I always go back to what I would consider the classic, the ice, the whiskey, sugar, bitters, and the uh, orange peel. And that's it. Chenet. That's it. Simple enough. Simple enough. Um, let me see. How are we all doing? Right. We're, what, four hours in, three hours in, eight hours in? Who knows? Time means nothing. It's arbitrary. It's absolutely arbitrary. Uh, Rebecca says, uh, oh, sorry, Anne-Marie says that she'll get hold of that bush mills. Anne-Marie, you have to. Um, you're not going to get a better value Irish whiskey than this 10 years old for $44. It's incredible. Absolutely incredible. Uh, so those are the three whiskeys I drank tonight. Um, let me see. I might finish with a pour of something special uh, that I have sitting here. That's, uh, you know, we have to treat ourselves every now and again, you know. We're, we're all, uh, we're going through tough times, as Niall says. Uh, it's okay to feel not okay sometimes with the world and uh, accept that it, even if we're not perhaps personally aff afflicted or affected uh, physically, there's no doubt we're being affected mentally by what's going on in the world. So if you find a chance for self-love and self-care and treating yourself, don't wait for a special occasion to, to, to open that special bottle that's sitting on your shelf. Open it now for fear that that moment, that special occasion you have in your mind, it doesn't live up to the expectations. Or we might never get there. Isn't that, wouldn't that be the awful thought? So open those bottles. Open them, drink them, enjoy them. I'm going to enjoy a drop of um, red breast, all port cask, a 30-year-old drop. Um, why not? Because, listen, isn't it here? Aren't we lucky enough to have it? We pour a drop of it, and we'll treat ourselves. It won't drink itself, and it's not going to get any better in the bottle. As Billy Lighton says, he makes whiskeys for drinking, not for staring at. So we must drink them for fear of letting Billy Lighton down. Look at that color, look. When that put hair in your chest. Wonderful color. 30 years, 26 years in a port pipe, a port cask. 24 years in a port cask, uh, six years in a bourbon cask. And gives us this wonderful, wonderful color. All right, we're gonna a little sip of this. Cask strength. 57.2%. Oh, incredible, 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 incredible. Um, so yeah, so listen, if you have nice whiskeys, if you're lucky enough to have nice whiskeys, um, and I never thought I'd have a nice whiskey in my hand, uh, then if you do have a nice one, drink it, enjoy it. Raise it to yourself, if nobody else, or to those who are around you. JJ says, next thing you'll be bringing out a teaser of the 46-year-old um, silent distillery. I won't. I get no sight nor sound of that 46-year-old silent distillery yet. Today, one of the oldest whiskies ever released in Ireland, 46 years of age, from Middleton Distillery, from the distillery that gives us red breast, released a, a, a single pot still whiskey that was made in the old Middleton Distillery. Old Middleton Distillery. They haven't made whiskey there since 1975. And the one of the last uses of the world's largest pot still in Middleton gave produced whiskey that has spent the last almost half century maturing. So if you've not been uh, uh, privy to the news or seen any of the posts or pictures or shares about this whiskey, it's called the Silent Distillery Collection. A silent distillery is a distillery that no longer operates, no longer produces whiskey. The old Middleton Distillery is a silent distillery. So when you go to visit the Middleton Distillery in County Cork, the tour you get will be of a distillery that no longer functions. So you'll get a tour of a, and an explanation and a walkthrough of the old processes. That distillery closed its doors to make way for New Middleton, New Middleton Distillery built uh, just behind it, which opened in 1975, where Powers and Jameson consolidated their production in County Cork. In any case, there has been whiskey sitting in casks for the last 46 years. In fact, for the last 50 years, waiting for its moment now think about the evaporation that takes place every year, 2%, one and a half, two percent 2% a year. Um, by the time you get to 45 years, you're probably looking for whiskey in that barrel with a teaspoon. And you're going around the bottom trying to pick up bits that you can put into a bottle, so little is left. And that's what's been released, a 46 year old uh, whiskey, $45,000 a bottle, only 70 bottles in the world. It's not for everyone, nor should it be. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a, a celebration of a distillery 
that is gone, a distillery that changed the landscape of Irish whiskey distilling and Irish whiskey history, and that gave rise to the distillery and the whiskey industry we know today. It will sit on the shelf for most people for the rest of their lives and sadly won't be enjoyed. Uh, and I hope people do get to open their bottle if they do own one and they enjoy it. If they are of sufficient wealth that drinking a $45,000 bottle of whiskey is the same as you and I drinking a $20 bottle of whiskey, then more power to them and we celebrate their, their success. Uh, but I'd like to see it enjoyed and maybe somebody will enjoy it. Uh, and could they please report back if they do and share with us what we've been missing all these years? Martin says we should shred the barrel and chew on the wood. <laughs> we should. We should. Um, and Marie's going to take two. A great daily drinker for Mark. Yeah, these are, I mean, what wild times. Uh, do I have a picture of it here? I think we have a picture of it here somewhere um, that I'll put up on the screen. For those of you who didn't get a, a look of it earlier on, we'll show you a picture of it here. I'll show you a few pictures of it. So Silent Distillery, 46 years old, comes in a beautiful cabinet. Um, and this cabinet was made by a man from Cork as well. His name was John Galvin, is John Galvin. There it is. How about that? So this is the Silent Distillery, uh, Chapter 2. Chapter 1 came out last year, which was 45 years old. This year is 46 years old. Next year will be 47, all the way up to the year 2025. And in 2025, there will be a 50-year-old release. And that's a very special year for the Middleton Distillery because in 2025, it celebrates 200 years as a distillery. 1825, they first started distilling, the Murphy family in, uh, in Cork, in Middleton. And uh, yeah, that'll be a, a, a momentous time. We have to be able to go to Middleton at that stage, surely. Surely there's a Stories and Sips party waiting to happen in 2025 in Middleton. And maybe we'll uh, find our way to a bottle of this somehow. We'll finagle a sample from somebody. Interestingly, uh, I, I caught a peek of the video that was sent to the cask circle. And the cask circle is the, the buyer's list of uh, individuals, let's say high net worth individuals who buy their whiskey directly from Middleton in barrels. Uh, they might buy a, a cask of... 30 year old single pot still that might cost $600,000. In any case, the cask circle is a very exclusive club and you can join it if you purchase a cask from the Middleton distillery. And uh, they got treated to a sample of this, uh, which was uh, ferried to them uh, along with a sample of water from Middleton, a little water uh, from the, maybe from the Dungourney river treated, hopefully, uh, which they were uh, able to use to add to their whiskey to uh, see if it exposed some of those notes. Uh, so interesting story, interesting whiskey, and uh, I, I'm not a fan of the begrudgers who think that whiskey shouldn't cost this much or that uh, this just drives up the price of whiskey. I'm a much bigger uh, fan of celebrating the fact that Irish whiskey, for the first time in our lifetime, in fact, ever, gets to compete with the McAllens and the uh, Bowmores and the Dalmores uh, on the top shelf and the Duty Free and also uh, on the top shelf of the world's greatest bars and in country estates and wealthy homes around the world, maybe now an Irish whiskey goes head to head with a scotch. That's a good day because there's a halo effect for the rest of the Irish whiskey industry for red breasts and Middleton very rares and Teeling and Mid uh, Waterford whiskey and, and many more. So it's a good day. It's a good thing. Doesn't mean we have to buy it. Just like I don't believe that a Lamborghini shouldn't exist just because I can't afford it. I celebrate its existence and its craftsmanship uh, while equally not being able to afford it. And I think that's a more rational approach. A sniff of the bottle, people want. A sniff of the bottle. Empty that 401k. <laughs> I would imagine that there is a danger with a bottle this age, this old, that the whiskey, well, let's be honest, not a danger. There, the reality is that the whiskey is never going to live up to the price in terms of the linear comparison um, between age and price and flavor and price, etc. When that whiskey was first put into a cask in 1975, the wood management techniques employed in the whiskey industry were very different than they are today and perhaps not as good and not as uh, managed and mod uh, moderated and uh, yeah, monitored. So the wood was not perhaps as good and so Today, I think we can get better whiskeys that are younger 
because of the wood management that has uh, been implemented in the Middleton Distillery that has then since been educated and, and taught to uh, the rest of the Irish whiskey industry. So it's not going to live up to its hype taste-wise, but wouldn't it be nice to get a taste of a piece of history that had four different master distillers had a hand in it? Max Crockett, Barry Crockett, Brian Nation, and Kevin O'Gorman. That alone, you know, if you could if you could find a way to a little sample affordably, just to know that you're part of that history and feel a little bit more connected to it, I think that would be a very special thing. At forty six thousand or forty five thousand dollars, not going to happen. Maybe at five hundred or a thousand, maybe somebody would be willing to spring for a connection to it somehow. Who knows? Who knows? Does it come with instructions? It does, JJ. Pop it open and neck it. That's the only instruction you need. Okay, so what are we now? Three hours in, three hours and four minutes. Um, what's going on in the world of stories and sips? Next week, we're coming to you live from Japan. Yep, live from Japan. Uh, the lock-in is going to be co-hosted from Japan. Rob Hennessy is an Irish expat living in Japan, and he has gathered together a bunch of Irish whiskey enthusiasts who are Japanese, an Irish traditional music band who are Japanese, and we're going to have some crack. We're going to sip on some whiskeys. We will be uh, sharing those at, on Monday or Tuesday. Uh, these should be fairly accessible whiskeys that we'll get for you. Nothing, nothing ridiculously Japanese uh, or difficult to get. But I want to talk and learn about the Irish in Japan, Irish whiskey's growth in Japan. And I want to learn about the Japanese whiskey industry from an Irishman's perspective and from a Japanese person's perspective. So that's going to be some fun. So we're coming live from Japan. We have other great lock-ins planned over the coming weeks and months. Uh, more details coming soon. There may or may not be uh, our first uh, Stories and Sips live in-person tasting event post-pandemic coming up in the next six weeks in Ohio. That may be coming up. Uh, we'll have more details on that for anyone who is in the Midwest and wants to travel to a fun event, safe, outdoor, social distance event in Ohio. I'll be fully vaccinated next Friday. And uh, looking forward to that and the opportunities that opens up. And hopefully more of you will be too. That's what's coming. What else is, is coming up? Our Waterford Whiskey podcast uh, continues uh, to be downloaded. And today, Waterford Whiskey won the World's Best Irish Whiskey Award and the World's Best Irish Single Malt Award at the San Francisco Wine and Spirits Contest competition, which is great news for one of their releases, the Hookhead release, which is in uh, Wexford. Hookhead is a... Uh, uh, yeah, lighthouse and uh, area down in Wexford. And uh, so that's great news. So Waterford Whiskey continues to grow and thrive. What else? Um, Johnny wants the contender. <laughs> Are you sure now you want that? The contender is the song we have sung uh, almost as many times as we sing the old triangle um, about Jack Doyle, the boxer from Cove, from Cork, who famously rose to fame and fortune not just as a boxer, but as an actor and a singer, selling out Carnegie Hall. Sadly, the devil, the devil that is the drink took hold of him and he wasn't able to manage it. Um, I have learned through trial and error that um, a, a little secret, that if you're having a three hour lock-in, if you have one of these things um, and drink one of these, it actually not only uh, helps you the day after, but allows you to be vertical after a three hour lock-in as well. I don't think Jack Doyle learned any of those uh, tricks about drinking a drop of this as well as a drop of whiskey. In any case, uh, that man met a sad fate, dead on the streets of London, penniless, broke. And, and he, a world famous singer, boxer and actor in the 1930s and 40s. Um, yes, um, I could sing a tune. I could sing that. Uh, or we could sing the old, old triangle. Or we could do an old sea shanty. I don't know. We could do a sea shanty to sing us out. We've never done a sea shanty. All right, so you got to vote on it. Sea Shanty, Old Triangle, or The Contender? Or Barry, shut up and go away, please. We have things to do. I won't be offended. Maureen wants a Sea Shanty. You want a Sea Shanty? Oh, <laughs> I will bow to a crowd 
crowd pressure, peer pressure. Sea shanty, sea shanty, sea shanty, sea shanty. You're getting a sea shanty. What would you do with a drunken sailor? All right. We'll do a little sea shanty so to sing us out. Um, all right. <laughs> Mrs. Stories and Sips thinks this is all hilarious. Okay, this is a sea shanty called The Weller Man. The Weller Man. And it has uh, achieved uh, TikTok and Instagram fame uh, as being a sampled sea shanty with many, uh, many different vocal versions and many, what would, what would you call it, like a, when people combine all of their voices? Oh yes, harmonies, many harmonies together. Look, I'm 45 whiskeys in, I can't even remember what a harmony is. Okay, we'll sing the uh, sea shanty so because uh, <laughs> so many asked for it. doesn't mean it's going to be good, it just means I'm going to sing it. All right, let me oil my pipes here. This is a sea shanty called Wellerman. Are we ready? Here we go. There once was a ship that put to sea. The name of the ship was the Billy of Tea. The winds blew up her bow, down, down, oh, bow, my Billy boys bow. Soon may the Wellerman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. She not been two weeks from shore when down on her a right whale bore. Captain called all hands and swore he'd take that whale in tow. For the boat had tipped the water, the whale's tail came up and caught her. All hands to the side harpooned and fought her when she dived down low. Soon may the wellerman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, I'll take my leave and go. No line was cut, no whale was freed. The captain's mind was not of greed, and he belonged to the whaleman's creed. She took that ship in tow. Soon may the wellerman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. For forty days or even more, the line went slack, then tight once more. All boats were lost, there were only four, but still that whale did go. Soon may the wellerman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. As far as I've heard, the fight's still on. The line's not cut and the whale's not gone. The wellerman makes his regular call to encourage the captain, crew and all. Soon may the wellerman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done. We'll take our leave and go. Soon may the wellerman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. <laughs> there we go. There's our sea shanty. That's the end of it. That's the rum cask. That's it. <laughs> we should be foot stomping. <laughs> Slaunch, everybody. Michael Egan, what are you doing here? You should be uh, you should be out partying in Chicago in a, in, a, in an outdoor safe space, watching the lock in. <laughs> See shanty, it was. All right, that's the Weller man. So that's it. That's the end of our lock in. What are we now? Four hours in? Three hours in? Who knows? Three hours in. It's time for a, a, a bite to eat, a bit of food, and a, a bit of time at Mrs. Stories and Sips. And uh, as fun as you all are, it's more fun to hang out at Mrs. Stories and Sips on a nice Friday night. We'll have a glass of whiskey, and we'll have a, a bite to eat, and we'll have a good old time. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks to Niall Conley for entertaining us with some great tunes. Uh, thanks for, to David Boyd Armstrong for telling us everything and also nothing about uh, the Redaman Estate Distillery. We're excited to hear what's coming next from them. And uh, please join us in our Facebook group, Irish Whiskey Fans of America. And do me one last favor before you go tonight. Click like, comment, or share. It helps get the lock-in viewed by more people. And when that happens, uh, more people get to enjoy a bit of community and a bit of crack and a drop of Irish whiskey at the same time. Shin A. 
Thanks, everybody. Slauncher. We see you next week. Be safe.